Hello friends. This is Muse Fanfictions. How are you all? So in this video, we will see what if Naruto was the the emperor of Outworld and became the Dragon King. Summary says. Naruto. Emperor of Outworld. Conqueror of the realms. Former advisor to the Dragon King. The one who defied the elder gods. But who was he before all of this? Simple. He was once a blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy, who wished to achieve a dream that he would realize would not be possible. Why? Because he would be betrayed by the village and set him on the path of conquest. But before we start, if you want more stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe and like this video, and if possible share this video with your friends. Now let's start the story. I am Shao Kahn. I am Shao Kahn, conqueror of worlds, you will taste no victory. I was once the ruler of Outworld. I am Shao Kahn, and you will bow to me. I was its emperor. Feel the power of Shao Kahn. I challenged all who opposed me. Feel the wrath of Shao Kahn, from the Elder Gods. The Elder Gods fear me, now. To the Thunder God Raiden. Now, Raiden. Your world ends. I was once the advisor to the previous Emperor Onaga. The Dragon King before I killed him and took the throne. I am emperor now. I was a warrior. You will die, mortal. I was a conqueror. You will never win. But who was I before that you ask? My answer to you? I was a boy. Loser. I was naive. One day I will become Hokage and everyone will look up to me. I was weak. The demon is powerless. Kill it. Avenge Yandaimi Sama and our loved ones. I was once a shinobi of Konoha located in Fire Country. I never go back on my word. That's my Nindo. My name? Uzumaki Naruto. Baka. Why don't you just die? No one loves you. And I was betrayed by the village I loyally served even if they didn't deserve my loyalty. For harming the last Uchiha of Konoha with your demonic powers, by the power invested in me as the Gondame Hokage Senju Tsunade hereby sentence you Uzumaki Naruto to death. And that was putting it mildly, from the beginning. Naruto was tied to a pole, chakra draining rope, suppression cuffs, spiked chains covering his exposed bleeding torso, and one wrapped around his neck to make him look up at the woman he brought back to be Hokage. She of course was glaring at him and he in turn glared back with hatred at her betrayal. After he brought back the rogue Uchiha, Naruto found himself restrained, sent to the prison cells below the Hokage Tower where T and I were ordered by the Hokage herself to get answers out of him about what happened by any means necessary so long as it didn't break the seal holding Kayubi. And so they did. They were led by Morino Ibiki and Mitarashi Anko. Neither of them or their subordinates seemed to care about their target's health. Why would they? It would be counterproductive to their jobs. At first, Naruto told them what happened at the Valley of He End with Sasuke when they fought before anything even happened. Simple right? Wrong. Naruto barely got the words out, but within seconds of telling them what had happened, he was attacked by them, demanding the truth, and again Naruto told them word for word what happened. Hoping they would see reason, but they didn't, they did not stop in their methods. Again, he told them the truth, but by the fourth time telling it in the hopes of making the abuse stop failed, Naruto knew it wouldn't like he'd hoped, and it only just increased. They called him a lair. A demon in human skin, a monster that did not know how to speak the truth, and they all tried very hard to beat the real truth out of Naruto. However, despite all of this, Naruto's story never changed, and it only made them hurt him more with each passing second. When they realized Naruto wouldn't change his story no matter what, they surprisingly stopped their assault, but brought in Tsunade and Jiraiya to have a few choice words with him. It was on this day, Naruto was told his entire life, as crappy as it was growing up, and just about everything else he had been made to believe was true was in fact. A lie. The Sandame Hokage was not dead like everyone first believed. Like Naruto had been led to believe, his death was faked. Orochimaru's attempt to kill him. Staged. All of it the Sandame Hokage was alive, in a new much younger body, and feeling better than ever thanks to his former student Orochimaru of all people providing it for him. His two godparents, revealing that to him too, told Naruto about the plan to baptize Konoha in fire, blood, and war. 
one that would make the next generation of shinobi ready for the future for an even bigger war that was foreseen by the toads and the higher ups were planning to use to make the leaf the dominate shinobi village if not the only shinobi village left in the elemental countries at the same time jiraiya and tsunade revealed that naruto's childhood all been done by the sandame hokage skillful design by filling it with abuse pain suffering and anguish it was done to cement the boy's loyalty to the village while keeping him too weak to fight back when the time came to subdue should he get to unruly for their tastes. The mere fact Naruto beat Sasuke, who had far more shinobi training than the other members of the rookies of his graduating class, spoke volumes to them. The sheer fact that Kakashi only taught Sasuke the entire time, further proved to the higher-ups that Uzumaki Naruto had gotten too strong for their liking that if left unchecked or allowed to grow further would make the Jinchuriki a threat to the village should he ever learn the truth about his heritage they deliberately kept from him. So they decided for the good of the village as a whole and their overall plans in general from being put in further jeopardy. To cut their losses. And by cut their losses, they meant cut Naruto out of their lives completely by killing him before anyone outside of Konoha knew what was really going on. But surprisingly that wasn't even the worst news Naruto got that day. The Yandaimi Hokage, Namikaze Minato himself, his own father was alive. And not just him either. His wife Uzumaki Kashina and their daughter named Uzumaki Naruko were alive as well. The night of the Kayubi's attack resulted in Minato sealing half of the fox inside himself and the other in Naruto. But what no one, but those in the most highest positions in Konoha knew, was that a plan had been created based on Jiraiya's Child of Prophecy, to ensure Konoha was unchallenged by the world. The plan was simple. The plan was to have Minato, Kashina, and Naruko go into hiding. The Sandame would be reinstated back as Hokage of Konoha until the time was right to come out of hiding. The plan was for Orochimaru to help provide a body for the slowly growing old man to transfer his soul into it and extend his life through new body. Naruko would be trained by both her parents to one day return and take up her birthright as both a Namikaze and an Uzumaki. As for Naruto. Dot the plan involved meant he got the short end of the stick. Why? Because neither Minato nor Kashina wanted him. Kashina had wanted a girl from the start, she didn't want a son. A son meant raising a possible pervert of a boy. She did not want that and didn't want to deal with some whiny boy for a child. But a girl like her daughter would be easy, as she could bond with Naruko, laugh with her daughter, and have all sorts of fun together since they would have the same personalities. Why should she bother wasting her time in bonding with a boy that could be like Minato? Why should she bother raising a son, who would never be able to understand her when growing up? To much work. It was better to just leave the brat in the village for them to get their kicks out of hurting the boy and make him into the weapon they planned from the start. As for Minato, he also wanted a daughter over a son because like Kashina, he didn't care for having a male progeny, and wanted a daughter to spoil silly. The former Yandaimi Hokage had also feared that if Naruto had Kashina's personality, the boy would take up too much of Minato's time. The man didn't want to deal with the brat, as his time could be spent elsewhere doing more constructive things, and not on the boy himself. Besides, Minato needed time to master his newfound powers, and wasn't about to risk the possibility of the both halves of the Kayubi somehow getting back together again by accident. When they were informed by Jiraiya of what Naruto had done at the Valley of the End, being that weakest leaf shinobi of his generation beating the supposed best, the family came back, and were now among those ready to see the Kaiubi Jinchuriki die via public execution. So this is how it is going to end for me huh? Everything I did for you, this village, and those pricks here now crying out for my blood openly. Dot was all based on a lie. Asked Naruto while Tsunade just glared at him. You are a tool Naruto. A tool that has become too knowledgeable and too powerful. We won't allow you to get strong enough take your revenge on us. Not now anyway with the truth revealed to you, replied Tsunade while Naruto growled at her. Look at it this way brat. You dying helps us out in the long run, remarked Jiraiya with a smirk on his face. And how do you figure that you perverted old shit? Asked Naruto before his face was grabbed hard by Jiraiya and they were looking the other right in the eyes. Because when you die, Kayubi will materialize in nine years, and we can reseal it up easily into Naruko. With both father and daughter being Jinchuriki with the seal, we can do some serious damage to Konoha's enemies, and bring this world under heel with the power of our child of prophecy. The real child of prophecy. 
Not some weak shit like you. Answered Jiraiya before Naruto bit his hand hard and drew blood. If I'm so weak, then I shouldn't have been able to make you bleed, countered Naruto before he was punched in the face by Jiraiya. Enough Jiraiya. For harming the last Uchiha of Konoha with your demonic powers, by the power invested in me as the Gondame Hokage Senju Tsunade hereby sentence you Uzumaki Naruto to death, declared Tsunade before Minato stepped forward, playing to the crowd, chanting his name, his family beaming with pride, and supporting the man every step of the way. Anything to say before I put an end to you son? One final thing to say to your father before the end? Asked Minato mockingly while looking down at his son who looked up at him with furious and cold blue eyes. Yeah. I do actually. Fuck you. Your so-called family, Tsunade, Jiraiya, and the old fuck monkey Serutobi standing beside them. I make you a promise on my own blood as an Uzumaki. A promise that I will not let death stop me from having my revenge. I will come back here to this village somehow, some way, and when I do, dot you are all going to die and there is not a soul in this world or any other that can stand in my way, exclaimed Naruto, as his eyes became red, and glowed with rage burning behind them. It was in that moment, time slowed down for the blonde, and he found himself standing in his mindscape before the fox himself. I can help you fulfill that promise young one, offered Kayubi with Naruto looking at him skeptically. And why exactly should I receive help from you of all beings? Asked Naruto with the fox looking deadly serious. Because like it or not boy. I'm your only chance of even having a shot at burning this village to the ground and everyone in it that has sided with your so-called family now waiting to see you die, replied Kayubi with Naruto narrowing his eyes at him. Bullshit. You just want to get your own revenge using me, exclaimed Naruto with the fox looking furious. Even if that were remotely true, does it really matter how you get revenge so long as you get it? We both get our revenge at the same time. You think my other half likes being sealed away in the Yandaimi? I can sense him wanting to get out, but the fool's seal makes it impossible. Imagine what they will do once I materialize in nine years after you die? I'll be sealed up again into your so-called sister and used like a weapon for their war machine. I will not be used in such a manner, declared Kayubi with Naruto nodding since he could see the fox's point of view. Okay. I'll help you get your revenge, if only so I can get mine. There is just one problem though. How do we escape from Konoha? I'm currently tied down with just about every seal there is that prevent you from giving me power to break free and just about everyone capable of suppressing you further has my body surrounded. Not much an escape if I can't even get free from my bonds, stated Naruto with Kayubi nodding. Which is why we will be calling on a higher power to set us free. The power. Of the elder gods answered Kayubi before looking to his right and Naruto followed his gaze to a seal design that the boy didn't see before today. Elder gods? How? asked Naruto while feeling the need to go to the strange seal with what looked like dragons surrounding it. Put your chakra into that seal and call upon the elder gods to honor their agreement when they help the Yandaimi make this damn seal holding me back. Normally, to call upon any god for a sealing like mine requires a contract, or pact be made on the grounds the intentions for the sealing were noble. This seal before you is a failsafe to use in alerting them that the contract has been violated. Call upon them to take you from this realm to another. But be warned. The realm you go to by their hands will be random to the point where not even they will know where you end up. For all we know, the realm in question could actually be hell itself. Not that it would be so bad for me, but for you. Dot not so good, said Kayubi with Naruto glaring at him. Oh great. Thanks for warning me and scaring the shit out of me at the same time, said Naruto before putting his hands on the seal and channeled chakra into the seal. Repeat after me everything I say. Make sure it's spoken outside your mind or else the elder gods will not hear. Hurry. Your bastard father is about to deliver the killing strike, said Kayubi before telling Naruto what to say. When Naruto's vision refocused on the outside world, he saw Minato's sword held high over his head, and about to be brought down onto the boy's head. However, before he could succeed, Naruto's hands shot to the ground, channeling what he could of Kayubi's chakra into his throat, and his own went to his fingertips. Within seconds, a seal neither Minato, Jiraiya, or Kashina had ever seen in all his years materialized around his son. Elder Gods. Hear me. The contract you made with the mortal to seal up the Kayubi inside me on the grounds of noble intentions has been violated. 
I call upon you now to honor your part of the contact to use your power to save this vessel from a death he does not deserve, exclaimed Naruto to the heavens before the seal below him began to glow even brighter. What is that? Stop him! ordered Hiruzen with the seal consuming Naruto in an ominous light that shot toward the sky while dark clouds formed above with lightning striking in various places. Use your most powerful fire jutsus. Kill the monster before he escapes, commanded an angry Tsunade, as she along with every other shinobi went through hand signs for a fire jutsu, and launched it at Naruto. Naruto held back from screaming out in pain, as the fire ripped into his body, and feeling his flesh tear from being pulled away from the post he was tied down on. The sky above where a portal to another realm awaited him was creating a vacuum of sorts, sucking the boy in along with the large mass of fire that burned his hair clean off. When the portal finally closed, the sky cleared, and it was all over. Naruto was gone. He was free. At last. But the promise of his return remained, echoing through everyone's minds and it was soon apparent to those responsible for the betrayal that the boy might actually succeed in getting his revenge. Naruto-kun. I'm sorry I couldn't help you like I wanted from the start, but I am glad you were free, thought one person, the only person possibly in Konoha watching everything, and had tear-stained eyes at seeing her crush about to die. The girl's tears of sorrow became one of joy at seeing him escape his intended fate. And in that moment, Hayuga Hanada was inspired to fight to break her own intended fate within her clan. She would fight to get stronger and wasn't going to let anyone stop her from making it happen. Outworld the Living Forest. A small group of Tarkatan demons were patrolling the Living Forest per the orders of their emperor Onaga, the Dragon King. He had sensed a rift in the realms and something had entered in domain uninvited in this part of his empire. I smell it. Whatever entered Outworld is near here said one Tarkatan while searching for their prey. A groan was soon heard by the Tarkatans and they made their way over to the small lump of burned cut up flesh that was on the ground before them. It was oozing demonic energy, but it was clear to them that this creature, whatever it was, or had been in life, dot was near the end of its cycle. What is it? A demon from the nether realm? Asked a second Tarkatan while looking the creature over. An oni maybe. His lack of skin resembles one of their kind remarked another Tarkatan while giving the body a kick and a groan was heard seconds later. We will take it before the Dragon King. Our master shall be the one to ultimately decide the creature's fate, said the third of the group before they picked the downed creature up and dragged it to the Emperor's palace. Dragon King's palace. Why have you brought me this thing? demanded Onaga, as he saw the creature his group of warriors had brought him, and was not impressed. He was the creature you sensed had entered outward my emperor. We brought him here for you to decide what his fate would be upon entering your domain, replied the leader of the group of Tarkatans. Onaga said nothing at the moment, as he rose from his throne, a massive creature if there ever was one, and walked with thunderous steps toward the creature. Staring down at it, Onaga noticed the flesh was slowly healing, and sensed the demonic power within this thing was the source of it. Using his own power, Onaga levitated the creature so it was staring eye level with him, and it was clear this thing was barely conscious. Who are you? Tell me your name. Speak. Demanded Onaga with the creature trying to breath much less speak. I I. I don't know, replied the weak creature. That's not good enough. How did you enter Outworld? What realm are you from? Demanded Onaga while tightening his hold on the thing. I don't know. All I remember is the pain from torture, suffering at the hands of others, and then escaping betrayal, escaping a death I did not deserve, gasped the creature in the Dragon King's grip. Onaga narrowed his eyes at the creature, sensing no life from it, but smelled something from the creature, and it didn't sit well with him. When he recognized it, Onaga's eyes widened, and he slammed the thing to the ground. You have the stench of the Elder Gods on you proclaimed Onaga angrily before he raised his leg to crush the creature in front of him. I don't remember anything about that. I don't even remember my own name, gasped the creature while Onaga paused in movement to crush the creature beneath his reptilian feet. Really? Now that's very interesting. Perhaps I was hasty in moving to end your life so soon, remarked Onaga while pondering what to do with this thing and walked in a circle around it. I want to live. Let me live said the figure while getting to its knees and hearing the loud thunderous footsteps of Onaga with the Dragon King circling him. I will let you live, 
but there is a price to pay for your continued existence and in my realm, replied Onaga with the creature nodding. I will pay it. Whatever it is you ask of me, I will pay it, replied the figure with his eyes shifting between blue and red to the Dragon King's shock. You will pledge your loyalty to me. You will serve me and my army here in Outworld. You will fight. You kill. You will conquer, declared Onaga while his various shadow priests entered the throne room. I will serve. I will use all my power, my strength, and skills you give me to fight for the glory of Outworld, exclaimed the figure while trying to stand. Good. Now to ensure that you can fulfill your pledge. As you are now. Your body is weak. Too frail to be useful to me as you are in your current form. We need to change that, remarked Onaga before calling upon his power while the shadow priests did the same. The little creature, human from what Onaga recognized after some of the wounds the boy was showing from earlier had healed was now covered in dark magic, and levitating in midair before them. Soon, all the shadow priests in the room, and Onaga began chanting in ancient mystical tongue. The human child covered in their dark magic started to jerk left and right, fighting back the pain he was feeling, and the changes his body was going through at the moment. The boy could feel his muscles expanding, tearing, ripping, the body shredding itself inside, and it soon became too much for the strange child to handle. All he could do was scream out in pain. Soon, the scream of a child became the scream of a man, and the figure behind the magic fell to the ground when ritual performed on him faded. The boy now turned man breathed heavily, his body was naked, not an ounce of body hair or fat was on him. Eyes that had once moved from blue to red were now permanently red and glowing with power. The figure struggled to stand at first before stabilizing himself and looking at his new form. While the figure found himself considerably taller than before, the overall height and mass of the Dragon King was much bigger. Not only that, but the reborn warrior now found his mind was sharper more focused, and began to remember things from his past. Images of people he knew, his interactions with them, scenes of his childhood coming in clearer with each passing second, and most of them were unpleasant to say the least. He also remembered. Dot her. The one girl who caught his interest with her inner strength and passion. A diamond in the rough. She was shy at first from what he remembered of her. Especially when around him, but then an image appeared in his mind of a battle, a fight between someone of her blood, and how this girl kept fighting. The girl showed a warrior's spirit when she kept on fighting, even when she knew she couldn't win. Despite the fact this opponent was stronger than her, had hit harder than her, and intended to kill her. This girl stood her ground, ready to face death at the hands of her own blood, and the memory showed she had looked at him at one point with a smile on her face. And then the memories of others around him appeared. Only they were not so friendly like the girl had been. Pain from those memories surfaced. It involved training of some kind, but from what the man gathered, it involved his team of kids his age using him as a punching bag, and those from other teams along with their teachers. The laughter, the mockery, the humiliation at being beaten with so little training while the teachers mocked him for it when they deliberately denied him the training to get stronger. I will have my revenge on them. All of them. Down to the last backstabbing traitor living in it. I will one day return to that realm wherever it may be, and crush them, thought the figure angrily. Clothe him, ordered Onaga with the shadow priests coming forward before providing the tall figure with clothing and armor. Thank you my emperor. I will make use of this new life you have given me with great zeal, replied the figure after he was properly dressed before a shadow priest presented him with an ancient looking spiked, samurai helmet guise carved out a bone, and another presented him with a large hammer with the symbol of a dragon at the end. I know you will. Your old life is no more. Your purpose is to serve me and you will need a name befitting it. From this day forward, I Onaga, Dragon King, and Emperor of Outworld hereby bestow on you the name. Shao Kahn. Declared Onaga with the newly named Shao Kahn bowing humbly before his master before putting the helmet on his head. Shao Kahn. Yes. I am Shao Kahn. The Conqueror. The Conqueror. Of the Realms exclaimed Shao Kahn proudly and made it his mission in life to take each realm one by one until he found the one realm he was looking for that was once his home, before burning everything in it down the ground around him. He did have a revenge-driven promise to keep after all. For many years, centuries going into a single millennia to be exact, I served Onaga as a faithful warrior, and moved myself up the ranks of his army swiftly. First, 
I was just one of his many soldiers, then a commander, a general, and finally. Chief advisor. I worked hard in everything I did under his command, but it wasn't enough. I wanted to find the realm from which I was truly born in, from which I was hated by those residing in it, and by those fools no doubt celebrating what they had done. No doubt they believe what they saw was my demise and my promise no longer at the forefront of their minds or fears. Even their descendants most likely had no idea of my existence, my name being stained by those that wrote it, and mocking me for ages to come. It only drove me further, as one realm after another fell by my hands, I grew stronger in the process, and in time I realized that no matter how hard I tried, I may never find what I wanted. Especially when I noticed how Onaga was dragging his feet all for the sake of finding a means of achieving eternal life. Bah! Eternal life, who needs it? It's a crutch for cowards. I have been in so many life or death situations, I have no reason to seek out such a thing as eternal life. By the time my frustration had reached its zenith, it was at that point the idea to remove Onaga as Emperor of Outworld began to form within my mind, and a plan to kill him soon emerged. First, I had to weaken him to the point where I could kill him, and assert my authority to take control of the realm from those who would try to take it from me afterward. I wasn't a fool when it came to measure my power against Onaga. The Dragon King was stronger than I and by a good margin too. To face Onaga head on would be foolish, suicidal, and I am neither in regards to my chances in fighting him. So I planned it out. I had to weaken him, poison him using his favorite drink, using an agent loyal only to me, and handled the goblet Onaga drank from. The poison itself was tasteless, even to the Dragon King's own tongue, and by the time he realized something was amiss with his weakened condition. I struck him multiple times in the head. Violently. The irony of it was I used the wrath hammer, the very same wrath hammer that he gave me when I first came into his service. When it was over, I sat upon a throne, I had become the new emperor of Outworld, and I crushed all who opposed my rule. I gathered the strongest warriors of Outworld to serve under me and appointed their leaders as my most trusted generals. Prince Guro from the Shokan race had been made one of my highest rank generals and provided me with the loyalty of their race as a whole. I had them compete with the Centaurians for the right for it and keep the skills of both sides sharp through competition. The Tarkatans came next, as they showed promise with some of their brood with Baraka eventually becoming the general representing his race. Another trusted warrior was Reptile, but unlike the others who represented entire races, this creature did not, for he was believed to be the last, and was without a real purpose. Feeling a sense of something from a memory long ago from another life, I gave him one and brought the creature under my command. Many times, I had sent Reptile on scouting missions to find my realm, and on several occasions I thought he had succeeded, only to learn each realm he found was not the one I was once from and I could sense what I was looking for since I became Shao Kahn was still eluding me. I grew increasingly frustrated by my failure to finding the realm I was looking for after so long. I became increasingly impatient and above all else, increasingly aggressive. It slowed down however, after I conquered the realm known as, Adenia. It was a beautiful world, filled with life, and the resources of this realm made me want it all to be mine. Naturally, I was opposed by the king, and queen of the Adenia despite my right to take the realm after winning ten consecutive Mortal Kombat tournaments. They fought me for the right to Adenia, I won in the end, and took the spoils that came from the war. First, the realm itself was made mine. Second was the Queen Sindel, who I married, and made my queen while adopting Katana as my daughter. Sindel was a beautiful and strong woman, one of the reasons I made her my queen. The other reason was because a part of me believed that another girl from the past would have grown up to be just like the Adenian queen, and Katana would have been the daughter we would have had together. But in the years following my ascension to becoming Emperor of Outworld had made me paranoid, the memories of those who betrayed me would sometimes rise to the surface of my mind and Sindel's suicide years later strengthened it. All he had left was Katana, who I had raised as my own daughter, and trained to be my personal bodyguard at the same time. But even with that fact and knowing Katana was too young to truly remember her real father, I had suspected it was only a matter of time. Hence why I commissioned my personal sorcerer Shang Tsung to make preparations to make me a daughter using sorcery and Katana's blood mixed with Tarkatan. He along with the shadow priests assigned to the project succeeded and soon Mylenia was born. And aside from Melina's facial appearance being different along her mouth. 
she was an exact physical copy of Katana with only the color in their choice of clothing being able to tell the two women apart at a distance. Now I had twin sisters for daughters I could now call my own, but by the time this happened, Katana was starting to shift away from me, and the betrayal that was sure to follow once more made my blood boil. It reminded me of how that place had betrayed me, the people there betrayed me, and it meant time was turning against me on when the girl I raised as my own would stab me in the back. Hence why I had insurance in having Melina secretly assigned to watch Katana for when the inevitable happened in order to dispose of her. And the inevitable did happen. By that time, I had directed my attention toward Earth Realm, on the advice of a sorcerer named Quan Kai, who came to form a secret alliance with me at the behest of the fallen elder god Shinnok. I agreed, in the belief it would give me the edge needed to take Earth Realm, and call on the fallen elder god to combat the thunder god Raiden himself when I made the crossover to my newest conquest. I was mistaken. I had fought the warriors of Earth Realm and lost due to my own arrogance. Katana had betrayed me like I had foreseen, but Melina had failed to stop her, and I had lost one daughter at the hands of the other. It was by that point, I had to retreat, my losses grew, and I my strength declined. After I made my return to Outworld, I realized at this point that my weakened condition, my defeat at the hands of Earthrealm's warriors, and my overall failure in conquering Earthrealm was from me having grown stagnant. I had only been in a few battles since I had taken the throne, some of my muscles had become a bit flabby, my enemies had grown too strong, and my forces too incompetent along with too ambitious to fight them properly. Shiva had killed Motaro. Kano had allied with Shiva to betray her to me in exchange for my sparing of his life. Guro was now gone, Kantaro was dead, and I just had killed Shiva after she entered my throne room to kill me. As for Shinnok, he along with Quan Kai were now waging their own war with Raiden, and his Earthrealm's warriors who survived my battle. Sindel and Katana now had Adenia back after they pried it from my control and weakening me further. It was only a matter of time before my enemies successfully overpowered what loyal troops I had left and came for me. I had Shang Tsung on my side, but I had punished him after his failure in taking Earth Realm, and his loyalty was always in question when it came to serving me. The sorcerer always was an ambitious little snake. Part of my mind whispered that he was just like another pair of snake from a past long ago. So I had devised a plan. A plan to turn the tables and become more powerful than ever. I needed to get back into the fight. To turn the flab I had gained from sitting on the throne and barely fighting back into solid muscle once more. So I used almost all of my power to make a solid clone and flee from my position knowing I couldn't stay. Soon after, I heard whispers of my clone dying at the both the hands of Shang Tsung, and Quan Kai under false pretenses of an alliance. From what I heard, they came to my clone to offer the services of their powers to help my troops combat Adenia's army now allied with the Shokan to kill me. As I made my way through the terrain of Outworld, I saw the sight of a badly injured Guru, who lay dying at my feet, and would have surely perished had I not saved him with the last of the power I still had. Guru made have sided with the realm of Adenia, but I still respected him for his years of loyal service, and offered him it when he regained consciousness. That and to prove his race was superior to the Centaurians also helped provide the needed incentive to side with me. So we fled, fooling the Adenian warriors that Guru had been killed, and we escaped together to plan for my return to the seat of power. Though I soon learned it would become a challenge once more, as Onaga had returned from beyond the grave, more powerful than ever, and had killed the two sorcerers. I should know they died because Shang Tsung appeared before me in a crude body due to a pledge he made years ago to my person that would not allow him to die so long as I was alive. The three of us prepared ourselves, Guru rallying what troops he could to fight for me, and Shang Tsung going to a village he knew of in order to absorb the souls there to regain his lost strength while restoring his mutated body into what it had been prior to his death. And together, the three of us had succeeded in that regard. We fought our enemies all over Outworld. We grew stronger once more. The fire I had when I first became Shao Kahn had returned. The fire to fight my own battles personally that I had lost was back, and reminding me of my skills as a warrior. What I truly was in life. A conqueror of realms. By this point, Raiden's forces had failed to defeat the Dragon King, but were able to divert his attention, and weaken his position to the point where I could take the throne from him. We fought once more but unlike the first time where I had poison and surprise on my side, 
I had Guru helping me in the fight to kill the former emperor once more with his soul going to the nether realm. After Onaga had been dealt with, I went to deal with the Adenian forces fighting Onagas, and now my troops once more. When I smashed into the throne room, I saw Katana there being protected by her sages, ready to defend their princess with their lives, and fight to the bitter end for her. They should have known better than to trust Katana because the woman they were now protecting was not Katana at all, but in fact it was. Melina. My Melina. My daughter. My heir to the throne of Outworld should I die. But I wasn't dead. Not yet anyway. She had been impersonating Katana for some time, using her twin's forces to fight for the throne of Outworld, and become its new ruler. It made me proud inside at having such an ambitious daughter but that alone was not about to let me stay my hand in knocking the woman aside to take what was mine. Not that I needed to, as Melina personally killed the sages protecting her, and stepped aside to let me sit on the throne of Outworld once more so she could serve me. I was pleased and yet disgusted at the same time. Not by Melina, but by the revelation I had regarding how my sitting on the throne of Outworld was what weakened me in the first place had essentially weakened Onaga in the belief he could not be challenged and focus on achieving eternal life and ignore the delight of fighting to expand his realm. It was there, in that moment, I made another promise to never let the throne weaken me, and cause my downfall. That I would fight like all my troops on the battlefield and no one stopped me from getting stronger until not even the Elder Gods themselves could stand in my way. Speaking of Elder Gods. Shinnok had somehow saved Quan Kai and came to visit me once again about a pyramid hidden in Outworld, made by one of the Elder Gods named Argus. Hence why it was named the Pyramid of Argus, where it was said the power, rank, and abilities of an Elder God were locked away. A power that only a warrior of great strength and skill could achieve the right to become an Elder God. To become one of the very toothless worms I had come to despise with their rules and regulations on how realms should be taken by means of mortal combat. Still, to become an elder god was promising, as I could not only become more powerful, possibly become the strongest of the elder gods, but to find my home realm, and crush it like I had promised myself long ago. While those that betrayed me were long dead, it was only fair in my mind that their descendants pay the price, and I kill every one of them while the souls of the betrayers they are born from curse me in death. So after much thought, I accepted the alliance made between myself and Shinnok once again. However, I made a small reminder in my head to kill Shinnok once I became an elder god, and all of his followers joining him in death's cruel embrace. But there was a small catch it seemed, as I would not be the only one partnering up with Shinnok, as I would be forced to ally with Onaga, who the fallen elder god brought back, but weaker now than when he first returned to claim his throne, and he no longer held such a gap in terms of power over me. What was even more surprising was Raiden had been corrupted since his initial attempt to kill the Dragon King and offered all of us in the Alliance a deal. He would let the one who won have all the realms from the Realm of Chaos to the Realm of Order, Adenia, the Nether Realm, and any other we wanted with the exception of Earth Realm. Naturally we had accepted the deal for we knew that no matter what, Raiden along with all the other Elder Gods would have to honor it. Raiden himself had become an Elder God after his victory over Shinnok and still spoke for them despite his corrupted state. Therefore none of the Elder Gods could break it in the realm taken after taking the power at the Pyramid of Argus would not be in violation of mortal combat. The end result? After the fighting that would take place at the Pyramid of Argus, mortal combat would no longer hold sway over me. I would relish that day forever. Add to the fact I would be fighting in the heat of battle once more only strengthened my bloodlust further. Raiden's Earth Realm warriors had no idea of the deal he made with us, and yet he led them onto the field of battle on a united front against our side. My side. We all knew what was at stake. Both sides charged onto the battlefield, knowing that whoever came out the victor would hold the fate of the realms in the palm of their hands. To bring peace to the realms, or to bring about Armageddon. During the battle, the Pyramid of Argus appeared, rising up from the ground, and making itself known to us all at last. It drew us to the top of the pyramid-shaped structure where a bonfire-like flame stood, swirling, calling out to me, and me alone while saying, this is your chance. Take it, inside my mind. I fought my way there, to the top. Knock back one combatant after another with my wrath hammer. None could oppose me. I may not have been the fastest to race up the pyramid, but I was the strongest, and I could knock the more nimble warriors away. 
It was only after Shang Tsung broke the alliance did get farther than any of the others, but I forgot about Onaga, and his hidden thirst for revenge. The Dragon King appeared in front of me after I received a kick from the sorcerer and was carried away by my predecessor to be tormented by him. However, it seemed luck was once again on my side as it had been ages ago, for Onaga was attacked by something from behind, and it must have been something powerful due to how it seemed to injure him. I saw the opportunity to strike him hard. It was enough to throw him off course and crash into a nearby mountainside before crashing to the ground below. Fortunately, Onaga took most of the collision into the mountain, and when we fell so my injuries were minor. Not that I cared about being hurt, as the pain helped make me feel alive, and the Pyramid of Argus was still calling to me while hearing the roar of the Guardian Blade defending the power I so desired. But first, I had to deal with Onaga, and ensure he never got in my way again. The Dragon King was dizzy when he tried to stand with all his injuries from the surprise attack to mine and those leading to the fall had weakened him. He never saw the hit to his skull with my fists or the other blows I landed on him without mercy. I had known by that point, the only sure way to kill the Dragon King was to do it with my bare hands. No other substitute for his death would suffice or put my mind at ease in believing he was truly dead. After smashing his face in, I snapped his neck, and ripped it off before crushing it in my hands to ensure no form of regeneration could happen if the head was left alone for the scavengers to feast on. With my personal mission done, I ran back to the Pyramid of Argus, knowing time was of the essence, and any of the warriors from either side could possibly take the power of the Elder Gods for themselves. Fortunately, by the time I got there, it wasn't the case, as my enemies and allies had all killed each other to reach the top. Leaving only one other opponent aside from Blaze. Raiden himself. I would eventually defeat Blade in a well-earned fight before Raiden could even hope to stop me and my power was enhanced by the end result to new levels. Raiden himself was no match for me despite being an elder god, as he had been fighting the others earlier, and was not even able to tap into his full power as the god of thunder due to being in the realm of Outworld. Where are the elder gods, Raiden? Asked Shao Kahn, as he stood over Raiden's body and laughed at the pathetic sight before him that was the defeated thunder and elder god of earth realm. Their pathetic mortal combat shackles me no longer, declared the emperor after he picked up Raiden by the front of his armor before striking him several times in the face with his fists before throwing him across the top of the pyramid. They masquerade as dragons, but are mere toothless worms, mocked Shao Kahn, as he walked over to Raiden's downed form, his wrath hammer in hand, and saw the thunder god turning over before stomping a massive foot down on him. My venom spreads. It is the end of all things. Armageddon, exclaimed Shao Kahn, as his body was sudden covered in a golden fire, and bathing in its power. Stoop. Raiden yelled out, but all he got was a content sigh from the one standing over him. It is done. Remarked Shao Kahn before picking Raiden up so the two could look the other square in the eyes. Your time has passed said the emperor before throwing Raiden back to where had first fallen near his broken amulet. I need to do something. Anything. But what? The elder gods aren't intervening. There is nothing left I can do to stop Shao Kahn except perhaps. Thought Raiden, as he noticed the broken amulet on the ground, and reached for the majority of them. Ages wasted in foolish resistance. Now is the dawn of my rule, declared Shao Kahn, as he walked toward Raiden who picked up the amulet pieces, and began chanting in an unknown language. It made Shao Kahn laugh. Yes. Pray to the worms, Raiden. As your world ends, declared Shao Kahn just before Raiden finishes his chanting and brings his wrath hammer up to bring down the killing blow with a war cry. He must win, whispered Raiden before seeing the wrath hammer come down on his head. In that moment, time along with the fate of all the realms had been changed forever and so would that of Shao Kahn himself. He must win. I found myself jerked back by an invisible force and look around with sharp eyes at my surroundings. Was it a dream? Some kind of vision of the future? I see I am in my throne room in Outworld, my mind focusing on what just happened, and what was happening now. Was this some spell placed on me by a treacherous sorcerer? Was it the Elder Gods playing mind games? Did I just see myself standing on top of some strange pyramid in my own realm and defeating Raiden? That I caused Armageddon? I find myself shaking my head slightly, blocking the images from my head, and focusing on the task at hand. The conquering of Earth Realm. 
Shang Tsung had assured me that the needed tenth and final victory and needed to win this mortal combat tournament and to take Earth Realm would soon be mine. All the warriors competing to defend that realm were weak, their moral broken from previous losses, and Guro himself was the reigning champion. At least according to his prized sorcerer overseeing the tournament. It wasn't until the old man I once taught the dark arts fell to his knees before me did I sense a certain foreboding. A foreboding that was eclipsed by my rage that was ready to be unleashed before I even sensed it was there, but that thought was ignored after what I heard next. Shang Tsung had failed to win the final tournament. You failed me. Five hundred years I have waited. Now I must wait five hundred more. Roared Shao Kahn in anger, but in the back of his mind, he senses a form of deja vu. Like he had been in this same spot having this same conversation before in at another point in time. Shrugging it off, I narrowing my red smoldering eyes at the frightened sorcerer in front of me as he pleads his case regarding his failure, and I quickly silence him before issuing a command to Baraka to kill the fool. However, for all his pathetic excuses, Shang Tsung knew what to say, and how to say it in order to stay his execution. And thus, he convinced me to spare his wretched life in order to use him for another plan to take Earth Realm by having another Mortal Kombat tournament. While I grew sick of them after enduring 500 years of waiting for one victory after the next, Shang Tsung had convinced me one more couldn't hurt, and to hold it here in Outworld. That we would have a considerable advantage over Earth Realm's participating warriors and even Raiden himself. All that was needed was for Raiden to agree to the terms of this tournament. If he did, the Elder Gods would have no choice but to allow me the right to claim Earth Realm when my side won. However, I was also aware of what would happen should my side lose, a sense of foreboding arose in me again, and I had to ensure we did indeed win this time. So I commanded Shang Tsung to not only convince Raiden to have his warriors compete in this new tournament, but to have my sorcerer participate as well. Naturally, I could not have him compete as the frail old man, who lost to Earthrealm's newest champion, and risk another loss. So I gave Shang Tsung his youth back. His power was strengthened by my good graces and I made him realize that failure was not an option for him in this assignment. Only now, the sense of foreboding didn't leave like I had hoped. It lingered. Gnawing at me like some hungry rat nibbling the flesh off of a corpse in one of my dungeons. All I could do was ignore it, believing my forces would win in the end, and Raiden's followers would be crushed before I moved to take Earth Realm like I first desired. It was only later when my Mortal Kombat tournament was held, did I find myself filled with rage at the continued incompetence of my forces, and their inability to win against Earthrealm's warriors. It seemed none could stand against them, as Scorpion to Shang Tsung, Quan Kai, and my new Shokan warrior Kentaro had failed to prove their worth in assuring my victory. And in my anger, I lashed out at Earthrealm's current victor Kung Lao, by snapping his neck. And effectively killing him. In that moment, time slowed down, Raiden was about to attack me for killing the prideful boy without issuing the challenge of mortal combat. I was prepared to fight the Thunder God, but due to my short-sightedness on my part, I failed to prepare for the attack coming from Kung Lao's fellow Shaolin warrior Louis Kong, who was the previous tournament winner, and the one responsible for Shang Tsung's failure. In the boy's rage, he used his ability to create fire, and formed it around his fist before driving the appendage straight through my chest. I found myself reliving a memory of another time, from another place, and another foe doing the exact same thing to me. More than once. Only the difference then and now was I was being hit by a fist filled with fire. Not lightning. I lay on the ground, dying from the injury, I see my forces rush after Raiden's warriors, all of whom had quickly fled back to their precious realm. Victory now assured, and my ability to take Earth realm now lost to me forever. Part of me, long forgotten had screamed in rage at the injustice of it all, as my desires, and my ambition to getting my revenge were being taken away. And yet. Dot not all was lost. Quan Kai had not chased after Raiden and his warriors like my forces had after my fall. He used his powers to heal me and save my life before it was too late. When I appeared before my generals, I overheard them talking about who would be the one to take over as ruler of Outworld. Melina was nominated instantly as I had already decreed her my true heir, and daughter after Katana had brought Shang Tsung to me earlier regarding the project. The look of hurt in her eyes when I told the woman the truth brought about an ache in my heart at the time, but I crushed it knowing soon or later, Katana would have betrayed me. Now his former daughter was in Earth Realm with Raiden's warriors, 
no doubt celebrating their victory over me, and no doubt celebrating my supposed demise. Not to mention the newfound knowledge that Earth Realm is safe from any outworld invasion on my part. But I am not so easily vanquished. Quan Kai soon proposed to me that I should simply invade Earth Realm and to take what was mine from the start. I was angered by the sorcerer's words, as he knew perfectly well that I couldn't cross over personally into Earth Realm like I wanted to from the start. When my Queen Sindel killed herself, she had created a powerful magic ward to deny me that right, and thus prevented my body from entering the realm. The only way I could cancel out such a powerful magic out until now would be to win 10 consecutive Mortal Kombat tournaments to absorb Earth Realm into a part of Outworld. But like Shang Tsung at times, Quan Kai can be very persuasive in his arguments when he has to be regarding the rules of set forth by the Elder Gods. Not surprising when one of them was in the service of a former Elder God and knew all the rules by heart. The sorcerer in question had figured out a way to get around such a power, as he could bring Sindel back to life using his sorcery, and cancel out the magic ward created from her death. Not only that, but he could bring Sindel under my control, an influence so I would have a queen by my side worthy of me. No more betrayals. No more would I be denied a woman of strength, beauty, and skill befitting an emperor like myself. For a moment, I picture the image of a girl full grown into a woman similar to Sindel with long dark hair, lavender eyes, and a deadly skills in hand to hand fighting before banishing the image away. That person was dead for over a thousand years, no doubt she had moved on, and had her own line of children who had their own, and repeated it for quite some time. If she did have any descendants, I would spare them my wrath, or at the very least give them the chance to serve me when I found my birth realm. I am weary of sorcerers, Quan Kai. Prove your worth. Bring her to me, commanded a still angry Shao Kahn, as he saw the sorcerer humbly bow, and leave with his shadowy bodyguard for where Sindel's body was located. It wasn't long before Quan Kai brought my queen before me and the woman looked into my eyes with adoration like the sorcerer promised. She looked at me with love. She soon kissed me and I returned it with a passion. Sindel was mine again once more. And so was my chance to take Earth Realm. I called for my forces to prepare for battle. I was going to do what I should have done from the start and take an Earth Realm by force whether the Elder Gods approved or not. Once more, a sense of foreboding nod at my mind, but I ignored it completely, as my desire to take my queen in our bed, and conquer Earth Realm burned within my body. I was tired of showing restraint. Tired of playing it safe. Being cautious of what the Elder Gods would do should I violate the rules of mortal combat. Rules were made to be broken. However, my soon-to-be victory would come at a price. My army while vicious and many in number, were being repelled back by Raiden along with the Thunder God's forces. The Black Dragon Clan leader Kano provided my forces with modernized weapons to help fight Earthrealm's own soldiers but the weapons provided were in short supply and mine were not fully trained in what the mercenary provided for their use. I needed to make sure my authority over Earthrealm was absolute in the eyes of my future subjects, as I ordered Quan Kai to make take prisoners in order to prepare a soulnado to draw strength from the souls upon entering the realm. Unfortunately, while Quan Kai was successful, he failed to keep it open, and was soon lost thanks to one of Raiden's warriors. Before that, my newest general Motaro, who had taken over for the Shokan, was slain by Raiden during one of his hunts for any potential threats, and my patience was growing increasingly thin. Raiden's forces were holding their own, my losses were increasing, and it was only a matter of time before I was forced back before my own arrival. It was then my queen offered to hunt down these pests and eliminate them for good so I would not be opposed when I crossed into the realm. I agreed but I wasn't about to send Sindel to Earth Realm just to have her be killed by the combined might of the opposition. The Adenian queen needed to be stronger, more powerful, and more deadlier than ever before if this fierce warrior woman was going to fight her own daughter. And for that to happen, I needed Shang Tsung's help. Or rather, I needed the ever-large collection of souls residing within his body. At the expense of his life. He would not be missed. With my beloved queen now hunting down the Earth Realm warriors, I was preparing for the event of entering Earth Realm itself, and taking what was mine. No longer would I be afraid of the Elder Gods or the consequences I would possible face upon breaking their rules regarding the merging of the realms without the means of mortal combat. I was Shao Kahn. Conqueror of realms, it was high time I remind those around me of that important fact. However, when I exited the portal to Earth Realm, 
nothing could have surprised me more than to see Raiden Bo in submission. One of his prized warriors, Louis Kong was on the ground nearby, and covered in burns that looked like one would receive from being hit by lightning. Two of his warriors disobeyed the thunder god and charged me, but I batted them away with a fraction of my power. A shame really. The blonde-haired woman had a nice figure for an earth realm warrior. I thought of turning her into a concubine or slave girl temporarily came to the forefront of my mind, but that left when I saw Raiden stand before me. Only to bow in submission. Ah, Raiden. You have come to your senses, said Shao Kahn with a hint of surprise in his voice. Earthrealm's citizens suffer. Further resistance serves no purpose, replied Raiden in a humble tone while the emperor laughed. All these ages you have fought me. You denied me my rightful claim. Not this time, said Shao Kahn before standing in front of Raiden and hit the Thunder God with a mighty uppercut that sent him flying back. It was here, reality began to distort itself from events from another time. The Elder Gods fear me, now, declared Shao Kahn before laughing and lifting Raiden up by the front of his clothes. Their pathetic mortal combat shackles me no longer, declared the Emperor after he picked up Raiden and began striking him several times in the face with his fists before throwing him across the rooftop. His badly cracked amulet falling off of him and shattering into many pieces. They masquerade as dragons, but are mere toothless worms, said Shao Kahn mockingly while he walked towards Raiden, wrath hammer in hand, and standing over the thunder god before putting his massive foot down. You can feel it. Closing in around you. It is the end of all things boasted Shao Kahn while seeing this realm being taken over piece by piece. Elder gods, where are you? Why do you forsake me? asked Raiden while looking at the heavens above and awaiting for some kind of miracle by the elder gods. Your time has passed, said Shao Kahn after picking Raiden up again and throwing him across the roof. I don't understand. I've done what needs to be done and yet. What am I missing? thought Raiden while struggling to stand. Ages wasted in foolish resistance. I have won, declared Shao Kahn before he stood in front of Raiden's kneeling form. Yes. You have won, admitted Raiden, as he finally conceded defeat fully, and awaiting for the killing strike once more like what happened to his future self. Now, Raiden. Your world ends, declared Shao Kahn with a grin on his face and he now brought his wrath hammer up to deliver the killing blow while letting out a war cry. Only for golden lightning to shoot down from the sky, getting the Emperor of Outworld's attention, and the Elder Gods appeared around Raiden. They entered his body and healed him of his injuries before addressing the Warlord through the Thunder God's body. You violate our will, Shao Kahn. You merge realms without victory in mortal combat. Our penalty is clear, declared the combined voices of the Elder Gods through Raiden before they got golden lightning at the Emperor only to see it doing absolutely nothing except making Shao Kahn laugh. An anemic effort from ineffectual deities. Today, I become the Elder God, declared Shao Kahn, as he was not harmed in the slightest by the attack, and saw his opponent was now going to fight him for the right to this realm. He wouldn't have it any other way, the battle was brutal. One I had not experienced in years, in ages actually. My time sitting on the throne had done little to improve my position of my own power growing. The last time I faced such a powerful foe was when I ambushed my weakened predecessor Onaga, the Dragon King. But this was different. Onaga was poisoned, caught off guard, and did not see the hit coming. I was currently fighting a Thunder God, who was now empowered with the strength of the Elder Gods themselves, and they weren't holding back on me in the slightest. The gnawing feeling in the back of my mind began to return in force. I realized there was a chance I could lose here, but my pride wouldn't let me stop, wouldn't let me leave, and wouldn't be denied the right to this realm. I wanted it. I needed it. I fought wildly against Raiden, but he kept on dodging moving with his element, and pushing me back until it was too much. At another point in time, at any another place, I would have won this fight, and the realms would have been mine. But in my already weakened state, I was unable to achieve my victory over Raiden and the Elder Gods like I had first hoped. When the time was right, they finally made their move, leaving Raiden's body, and quickly surrounding mine before taking me away into the sky to face their divine punishment. I had lost. I had failed. I Shao Kahn, conqueror of realms and emperor to the realm of Outworld. Dot had been defeated. Which was why I find myself currently on my knees, bound in ethereal golden chains, 
all attached to the floor, and at this time surrounded on all sides within the center of Hall of the Elder Gods. Each of them has a face of anger surrounding their visages while glaring at my bound body. My eyes are closed, I'm too weak to even consider opening them, and I can feel my head is no longer covered by my helmet. I am exposed to them. All that I am is seen by the Elder Gods and it's clear they don't like it. Not surprising. To them, I was a demonic entity forged through the magic powers from Onaga, and the Shadow Priests. I was a vile thing that deserved to be thrown into the deepest darkest regions of the Netherrealm and have the demons down there rip me to pieces. This is an insult. This creature has violated our decree. For too long Shao Kahn has used every possible way to get around our laws. It is clear he must be made an example of to ensure no one else makes similar attempts, decreed one elder god loudly in the room. Many of them were nodding in agreement, but few said nothing while looking at me with their piercing gaze. I knew they were looking at me because I could sense it. As they did, I thought back upon my past, what led me to this moment, the reason why I done what I did, and why I first became what I did. My vow, my promise, and the principle behind my belief in keeping my promises. I must get free. I must get my revenge, thought Shao Kahn as he clenched his hands into fists while hearing the elder gods arguing on how he should be punished. It has been decided. The only punishment befitting Shao Kahn's crimes against us in the realms is death, bellowed another elder god at last. Some things never change, whispered Shao Kahn before letting out a chuckle. What? If you have something to say Shao Kahn, then say it, commanded another elder god, a female voice from the sound of it. You act like your eyes all seeing, that you are all knowing, but you are nothing of the sort. If you were, then you would know of our long lost history and that it is because of you that I was able to alive this long," remarked Shao Kahn while the Elder Gods now narrowed their eyes at him. What do you mean Shao Kahn? Speak! commanded another Elder God who had a deep male voice and was clearly not amused. Look through my mind Elder Gods. I know you can. Look at what I was before I came into the service of Onaga. Why I have done all that I have done. And. Dot the reason why I will not let you destroy me so easily replied Shao Kahn with his eyes snapping open and determination was now showing through his crimson red eyes. The elder gods looked at each other, clearly unsure if not curious about his words, and decided to investigate if what Shao Kahn said was in fact true. So they looked into his mind, going deep into the man's memories to the point where he was born, and began their journey to understanding him. They saw into the man's birth, the reason for them being summoned to help Monado seal the Kyubi into the child, and what soon followed the ceiling itself. The elder gods slowly became angry from what they saw, as they saw the abuse the innocent boy endured, how the boy struggled every day just to live, and even then there were quite a few close calls. They saw the shame of a test at a shinobi academy. The betrayal of one of the academy instructors in a quest for power. Another academy instructor secretly hating the abused child and for something he didn't even know about the truth of why he was hated being revealed to the boy. The farce of a genin team he had been put on with an even more pathetic instructor who also hated the boy. The training the team went through with the hated child getting little to no help at all in the field while those around him got so much more and used him as a training dummy before rubbing it in his face. They saw the battle on the bridge in wave country and the events that followed. The Chunin exams from start to finish, the invasion of the leaf village. The supposed death of the Sandame, dealing with two members of the Akatsuki. Bringing back Senju Tsunade to Konoha and nearly dying. Being saved by the woman he was looking to bring back if only to be used as a weapon later on by her and those under her future command. And then they got to the point in the memories where Uchiha Sasuke tried to desert the village for the power Orochimaru was offering. How the blonde fought him in a fight worthy of mortal combat. How the blonde blue-eyed boy, who was considering to be the weakest shinobi of his generation, had succeeded through sheer determination alone against the strongest. The blonde endured lethal blow after lethal blow that would have killed anyone else taking those hits and still coming back for more because that was the mission. And when the mission was over, when the blonde brought the Uchiha back, it was then the elder gods found their rage reach its zenith. The blonde boy was betrayed by those he trusted, his godparents, the Sandame Hokage who did not die like everyone first assumed. 
They saw how the boy had the truth revealed about how he was to be used by the village until his purpose came to an end, and would die. That the village's government official had feared his potential, his power, and what he would do wit hit if the truth was revealed. And set him up to die publicly at the hands of his own father. A man who violated the pact in the first place with the elder gods and conspired with others around him to take control of a prophecy foretelling the revolution or destruction of the shinobi way. How everyone close to the Yandaimi Hokage believed him to be the child of prophecy, and he had the power to change the world with Konoha being on top ruling it. It infuriated the elder gods when seeing this disturbing truth brought to light. How dare these mere mortals try and influence a prophecy for their own benefit? These mortals of this realm believed this Yandaimi Hokage was the child of prophecy, was no more the chosen one than the Sanin who trained him. In fact, the child of prophecy, the Sanin mentioned was actually the blonde haired blue eyed boy they were about to kill. It was when the boy they had learned was named Naruto was about to be executed by his father did the elder gods heard the boy's call, and making them remember what they did over 1000 years ago. Elder gods. Hear me. The contract you made with the mortal to seal up the Kyubi inside me on the grounds of noble intentions has been violated. I call upon you now to honor your part of the contact to use your power to save this vessel from a death he does not deserve. The elder gods saw the boy's body being burned torn to shreds while being sucked into the portal meant to save him, and ultimately landing in Outworld before being dragged in front of Onaga, the Dragon King himself. They saw how the Dragon King was about to kill the boy, that stayed his hand, and decided to change the child into his loyal warrior. A warrior he named. Shao Kahn. A warrior, who made a promise, and vowed to keep that promise no matter what. Even if he had to conquer every realm in existence. And the rest as they say. Dot was history. This is unprecedented, remarked one elder god solemnly while staring into the eyes of Shao Kahn. Now you see the truth. Now you see why I do what I do. Why I have done all that I have done. I will not be cheated out of my revenge. Not by Raiden. Not by Quan Kai, Shinnok, or even you the elder gods. I made a promise long ago to crush those in that realm and I will keep it. Dot one way or another replied Shao Kahn before he slowly began to stand. This has changed things, stated the female-sounding elder god. In what way? He violated the rules. Shao Kahn must be punished. Nothing exempts him from it even if his purpose is required to fulfill a prophecy, said another elder god in anger. If anyone is to blame for Shao Kahn's actions thus far, then the blame should be placed ultimately on all of us. Due to our lack of action in not being more careful where we sent the boy when called to help him, he ended up as a servant of the Dragon King. Not only that, but the mortals of the Chakra realm have become far too bold, believing they can do whatever they want without consequences. We also never did intervene when Uzumaki Naruto was being tortured by his own village in the Chakra realm while he was growing up. If we had, things would have been different, Onaga would have never turned the boy into what he is now replied the female elder god while Shao Kahn saw the others nodding in agreement. Shao Kahn must still be punished. There is no denying that fact. However, given the circumstances being partially, if not entirely our fault for making his rebirth under Onaga's rule happen, I think it's only fair Shao Kahn does something that will benefit us all, said a third elder god in a sagely tone. In what way? asked Shao Kahn curiously. As it stands, you Shao Kahn have violated our rules, killed countless warriors, and conquered countless worlds in your pursuit of the one realm you were born from. The one realm you wish to return to in order to destroy those that betrayed your trust and those that follow them. While we do not denounce you for your actions, we cannot approve of them either, and thus we must find a balance where all parties benefit, said the elderly sounding elder god. To that end, we believe that the best way to achieve justice for all sides, is to ensure you fulfill your original purpose as the child of prophecy, and send you back to the chakra realm. Your former home is on the brink of setting off Armageddon and they don't even know it because they are blind to their own greed. Even should we enter that realm, it puts us at risk of being sealed away, or someone there making a contract with us for some form of power. We tend to leave the chakra realm alone unless we have a necessary reason to interfere, said the female sounding elder god having seen that realm's future. However, to ensure you are properly punished for your past crimes, we hereby ban you from leaving the chakra realm unless we require your assistance, 
or should your realm need to be defended by participating in a mortal combat tournament, said the angry sounding elder god. Even if I agree to the terms, the betrayal happened well over a millennia ago. Everyone I know from that time are all dead, remarked Shao Kahn with frustration and anger in his voice. Actually, they are not dead. We have long since known about the potential behind the chakra realm soon after the Sage of Sixth Paths taught the world how to use chakra. To counter the developmental process of this realm from becoming too unstable or out of control, we used our power to slow time down considerably. A little over a millennia outside of the chakra realm is equal to six years within it, replied the female elder god to the shock of Shao Kahn. So they are alive. All of them, remarked Shao Kahn off-handedly while his mind began to process exactly what that meant. This meant his allies he had gained outside of Konoha. The various places that would no doubt welcome him with open arms once they heard of his return. He could build up an army, gather resources, form a new empire, and when the time was right, crush the leaf along with the very country that funds it. Konoha wanted to start an all-out war to bring about its superiority? Shao Kahn was more than happy to grant them a war, but not the one they would want, and not one they would win. Oh no! Shao Kahn planned to bring upon them a war that will haunt the people of the leaf to the end of their days and long after their wretched diseased souls were sent to the lowest parts of the netherrealm to suffer for their crimes. That would also mean. Dot was she even alive? He needed to know, he must know. Do you accept the terms we have set for you Shao Kahn? Or would you prefer we call you Uzumaki Naruto now? Asked one of the elder gods, who had yet to speak to him. I am Shao Kahn. Uzumaki Naruto's soul may reside within, but as far as the body that represented that weak boy is concerned, it no longer exists. As to your terms regarding my punishment, I accept, answered the former emperor of Outworld before the ethereal chain that held him broke. We will open a portal to a place in the realm near a place you are familiar with and are on friendly terms, replied the female elder god. Good. I will need time to recover my strength from the battle I had with all of you back in Earth Realm. There is also the issue regarding my former father holding the other half of the Biju's chakra. He should not have it within his body, replied Shao Kahn with the elder gods nodding in agreement. Agreed. It must be removed, said one elder god in a firm tone. Bring him here. I'll rip it out of him myself. It does belong me after all, said Shao Kahn with a grin on his face. Very well said another elder god before they called upon their power and opened a portal that soon spat out a stunned Namikaze Minato. Ouch! What happened? One moment, I'm on the field of battle fighting Iwa Shinobi, and the next time, here? Where the hell am I? Asked Minato before he found himself bound in golden chains that held the man in place. You were in the hall of the elder gods one Namikaze Minato. Do you know why you would be summoned to face us? said a female elder god with Minato struggling to get free, but was shocked with golden lightning from the chains. I don't know nor do I care. Do you not know who I am outside of my name? I am was once the Yandaimi Hokage of Konoha. The yellow flash. I will not be bullied by so-called gods and deities for their sick amusement, protested Minato while trying to draw on the fox's demonic chakra, but found it wasn't responding to him, and soon heard chuckling to his right. It's not fun being wrapped up in chains and hurt by those more powerful than you, is it Namikaze Minato? Mocked Shao Kahn while walking over to the struggling man. And you would be who exactly? Asked Minato with a glare despite seeing this mountain of a man with an almost demonic looking face standing in front of him before getting hawked to the point where his legs gave out. Come now Namikaze Minato, formerly the Yandaimi Hokage of Konoha. Surely you recognize your own son? Asked Shao Kahn while letting out a cruel chuckle when he saw Minato's eyes widen in shock and fear. No number it's not possible. Naruto is dead. We burned his body and saw it fade away into that portal. He was fatally injured. Even the Uzumaki bloodline limit couldn't have saved him for long, protested Minato in denial while Shao Kahn grabbed the man by the face and was staring him right in the eyes. I know it's hard to believe, father, who would believe me? Who would believe that I am your progeny? That I was once a skinny, malnourished, naive boy, who dreamed of one day being Hokage, and getting the respect I deserved. Oh yes, it has been quite some time since I was that frail little thing you called a son. A son you didn't want. A son you felt was not needed in your life. 
Also you can harness the power of your half of the fox's chakra sealed inside your gut to achieve more fame, power, and glory in the name of your precious Konoha, replied Shao Kahn before letting go of the shocked man on his knees. So you've come for revenge just like you promised us, concluded Minato while Naruto let out a chuckle. You think I'm going to kill you here? That ending your life in this place will satisfy my desire to crush you and everyone like you? Don't make me laugh declared Shao Kahn with Minato looking confused. So, you're not going to kill me here? asked Minato with Naruto smirking at him. No I want you to return to Konoha. Let them know that Uzumaki Naruto is alive, well, and getting stronger. I want them and you to come at me with everything you've got, said Shao Kahn while flexing his right hand before forming a fist. You would be foolish to not kill me here. When I get free from these chains, I'm going to show you why I was made Yandaimi Hokage of Konoha, said Minato while tensing his body and getting ready to use his powers to put down his son once and for all. Yes, about that. You know the Kyubi's chakra? The one half you have inside of you? asked Shao Kahn with Minato's eyes going wide. Yeah. What of it? questioned Minato with a hint of fear in his voice before he let out a gasp, followed by a scream of pain, and looked down in shock. His son's massive hand was in his torso where the seal was located. I'm taking it back. It doesn't belong to you. It never did in the first place, replied Shao Kahn into the shinobi's ear before he drew the fox's chakra out from the man and relished hearing Minato screaming out in agony. When the process was over, Shao Kahn backed away from Minato, letting the power of the fox's other half wash over him, synchronizing with his power which at one point was Kyubi's first half before Onaga merging it with his body from the beginning. Now the two halves were whole again, healing Shao Kahn of his recent injuries, restoring his lost strength, and showing memories of the Yandaimi Hokage's exploits during the Man Six, in Chakra Realm, years. Everything Namikaze Minato had ever done or was planning to do in the future was now known to Shao Kahn. You dumb bastard for a child. Don't you know what you've done? What I had to go through to learn how to use that power properly. What that half of Kyubi sealed inside of me did for the people of Konoha. What I was able to do exactly with its power under my direct command. Demanded Minato while trying to get off the ground, but failed due to a large portion of his strength if not all of it had been drained by the tall man in front of him. You mean using the fox's chakra inside of you to reverse the aging process with the help of Senju Tsunade's skills in medical ninjutsu? replied Shao Kahn with Minato looking at him in surprise. H how did you know? asked Minato with Shao Kahn tapping the side of his head. Why? The memories from half of Kyubi you sealed inside your body of course. Kyubi was never the mindless beast you and everyone else saw him as Namikaze Minato. Not that it matters anymore since that power is now far out of your reach, replied Shao Kahn while he was enjoying the sight of Namikaze Minato glaring at him in rage before the man decided on addressing the elder gods. Don't you realize what he has done? I am the child of prophecy, damn it! Even gods must respect someone foretold in prophecies and ensure they happen, said Minato while the elder gods did not look amused. What you say is indeed true former Yandaimi Hokage. However, you are not the child of prophecy, that was foretold would appear in your realm. But your son is, replied one of the elder gods to Minato's shock, horror, and fear before turning to face Shao Kahn who was laughing hysterically at him. Do you hear that my stupid father? I am the one the toad sage foretold about. Not you. Not Naruko. Me. And I already know how I want to proceed in dealing with the current way of the shinobi in the chakra realm, replied Shao Kahn with his grin never leaving him. No number you wouldn't, exclaimed Minato as he figured out what Shao Kahn planned to do, and wasn't going to allow it. I can and I will. Your time has passed old man. You along with every shinobi in Konoha and all of your allies will fall by my hands, replied Shao Kahn before a portal opened up several feet behind him and the chains holding Minato fell off the man. He can no longer stay here. Send him back to the chakra realm, commanded one of the elder gods and Shao Kahn grinned further. Give my best regards to my mother and Naruko. I intend to see those two, along with Jiraiya, Hiruzen, Tsunade, Kakashi, and all the other power-hungry traitors of my former home very soon," added Shao Kahn before throwing Minato, who was now screaming in protest after being launched into the portal. It is time, said the female elder god firm yet kind tone. Shao Kahn simply nodded, 
knowing he had to keep his end of the deal he made with the elder gods, and had every intention of doing it. It wasn't even a bad punishment for him actually. Sure he was going to be confined to one realm, but that didn't matter, and there was always a chance the elder gods might need his help one day. Or maybe the chakra realm would have to fight off another ambitious realm by means of mortal combat and he could leave to participate in it. Either way, Shao Kahn had no intention of backing out of the deal, and fully intended to get his revenge on Konoha in the process. With that thought in mind, the former emperor of Outworld entered the portal, knowing it would take him to the realm he was born in, and would have to fight with all his being to win. Once the portal engulfed his body, it closed behind Shao Kahn, and in silence filled the hall of the Elder Gods. I take it you sent Shao Kahn somewhere with solid ground to walk on? Asked Elder God Argus, as he appeared in his physical form in front of the other Elder Gods. Yes. I sent him to the first place to ever acknowledge his existence in life as a person. As Uzumaki Naruto. With any luck, the people there can bring the noble side of him out once more, replied the female Elder God while Argus nodded his head. And you also saw what I did regarding Wave Country in the Chakra Realm. How they are losing the war with Fire Country's forces after years of the two fighting within the political arena. Even now, I see the army of Konoha Shinobi have slowly yet successfully oppressed the country's populace there, and they have finished renaming the bridge after the traitorous boy, Uchiha Sasuke. The one Naruto brought back which resulted in his near execution, replied Argus, as he saw a lot of Shang Tsung, and Quan Kai in Uchiha Sasuke with their love for betraying others are going back on their word. We must believe that the soul of Uzumaki Naruto will balance out the cruel entity that Onaga turned him into all those ages ago. It is still there. We have all seen it within his mind, said the female elder god. Agreed. Now if you will excuse me, I must head back to Outworld and prepare for my sons to arrive," replied Argus, as he like the other elder gods had seen more than just the fragments of the future like Raiden did through his amulet, and needed to prepare for the war that was to come. Just because Armageddon was averted, didn't mean the sons of elder god Argus wouldn't be causing their own brand of trouble. Chakra realm near wave country, the portal behind Shao Kahn closed behind him. Looking around, he recognized the path in front of him, and his location was near where his old team had walked to get to wave country. Feeling his instincts pulling him toward this place, Shao Kahn headed for the country that embraced him like he was family. However, a sudden realization made him stop, as he looked at himself, and realized that his appearance screamed hostile, and his face wasn't exactly the most friendliest one you can meet on a bright sunny day. He needed to hide his appearance. Dot for now anyway. As luck would have it, bandits had made camp in the woods near him, their boasting and loud voices drew him to them with curiosity along with the opportunity of possibly taking what these fools had for himself. A cloak perhaps to hide his visage. Maybe money they stole from a caravan. While Shao Kahn had no need for monetary wealth for himself, he did see the need for it in making certain infrastructures of various realms function, and knew it would be required here in this realm. You see the bounty we got here. That caravan from Fire Country was loaded with loot boasted one bandit while drinking his sake. Yeah. It was supposed to be used to fund the war it's having with Wave Country. They've been having issues with each other politically, but now the Fire Daimyo is tired of talks and getting Wave annexed into its territory, replied another bandit with a smirk on his face. Not surprising. Wave Country is an island country, but has lots of resources ripe for the plucking. If Fire Country takes Wave, they'll increase their treasury in wealth, and riches that are five times what we got here. At least, said the bandit leader while showing the large pile of wealth in their possession. How are we going to transport all this loot? There are only so many us and the bags will weigh us down, asked one bandit before he was smacked in the back of the head. Baka. We have these sealing scrolls. Did you forget that Mizuki here is a former leaf shinobi? Said the bandit leader while patting Mizuki on the back. Mizuki. Here? thought Shao Kahn, as memories of the fool, the time at the academy, and then later when the Chunin tricked him into taking the forbidden scroll. Why did you leave? I mean, Konoha is stronger than ever. The Yandaimi Hokage came back. So did his wife, their daughter, and a whole bunch of the village's powerhouses, said one bandit while Mizuki sneered. Because the Yandaimi Hokage wouldn't promote me after I was released from jail. 
I was among the people who beat the demon brat up the most when it was younger and I worked harder than anyone at the academy to ensure its growth was stunted. And how did the man reward me for my troubles after I was let out of jail? I get a pat on the back, a mere congratulations, and a small pay increase that doesn't even cover how much I had suffered while in prison. Not only that, but in the years following my release, I couldn't advance in rank. I was denied each time. When I finally demanded my promotion, plus years back pay for my past suffering. Dot the fools in power threatened to throw me back in jail, answered Mizuki while Shao Kahn slowly narrowed his eyes in the shadows. Wow. Years of loyal service and they wouldn't even promote you for it. That's cold, said one bandit in sympathy. They said I would be promoted when the time was right. The time was right when I got out of jail, exclaimed Mizuki furiously while shaking his fists in anger. Aside from that, there had to be something else. I can tell from the angry look in your eyes, said another bandit while Mizuki sighed. I also hit on Aruka's slutty looking girlfriend. Mitarashi Anko, she was Orochimaru of the Sanin's first student he ever took on as an apprentice, replied Mizuki spitefully. Really? Wow. I've seen her picture in that bingo book of yours. She's hot, said the bandit leader with Mizuki smirking. Why do you think I hit on her? I tried to get between her legs, but all she wants is to be with Aruka. Bah. As if the man knows what to do with a slutty woman like that between the sheets. When she turned me down, I forced myself on her, but the bitch fought me off. Can you believe it? The damn slut refused me. She'll spread her legs for that twig for a man Aruka, but not me. I had to flee before I the Hokage could throw my ass back in jail again, explained Mizuki before he along with the bandits heard a cruel laughter. It's been a long time Mizuki. The years have not been kind to you it seems. Especially if you are hanging around with pathetic band of bandits like this group, remarked Shao Kahn, as he came out of the shadows, and stared at the man who once tormented him as a child while growing up in the village. One of many tormentors he was going to enjoy killing. Who the hell are you? Demanded Mizuki while he along with everyone else within the bandit camp was standing and brought out their weapons. You don't recognize me. I don't have a familiar look to you. I know it's been many years Mizuki, but even you should be able to look underneath the underneath, like all Konoha Shinobi Academy instructors tend to teach their students. Though if memory serves me well, you kicked me out of that class that day, and on the charge of tapping my pencil too fast on my desk, replied Shao Kahn with Mizuki's eyes narrowing in thought before they went wide with horror. No you are. You are. It can be you. It can't. They said you died exclaimed Mizuki with Shao Kahn now grinning evilly. That's it Mizuki. Look into my eyes. See past the crimson glow. Look deep within me and you will see the truth, replied Shao Kahn and let out a chuckle. Who is this guy Mizuki? demanded the bandit leader. It's the Kayubi brat. It's Uzumaki Naruto. Mizuki practically shouted while Shao Kahn's grin increased. You are partially right Mizuki. I was the Kayubi brat. I was Uzumaki Naruto. Past tense. I go by the name Shao Kahn now and as for Kayubi. We've merged completely into one single entity, replied Shao Kahn while walking toward the stunned group of bandits. So you're a demon now huh? I always knew you were deep down. Now your change just proves me and everyone in Konoha right. You are a freak. A monster. Declared Mizuki in the hopes it would somehow break what he believed was the former Konoha shinobi's still fragile mind. All he got was a cruel laugh from Shao Kahn. You know in another lifetime, I would have denied that statement. In another lifetime, I would have shouted out denials, spouted on about being Hokage one day regardless of what you, or anyone else thought. But after all I've been through since leaving Konoha and what I've done since my escape from the Leaf Village, I honestly can't deny your words. I am a demon now. I am a monster. And this monster. This demon that stands before you. It hungers for human souls. Just. Like. Yours. Replied Shao Kahn with the bandits and Mizuki looking at him fearfully for a moment before the latter tried to rally the others. We can take him. I know the brat. He was a baka growing up and no doubt he is a baka now. We're fighting one monster and we are many. We can win. Exclaimed Mizuki with the bandits looking like they had regained some courage and began to charge Shao Kahn. Fools. Compared to fighting Raiden and the Elder Gods together, this won't even be a challenge, thought Shao Kahn, 
as he summoned his wrath hammer to his hand in an instant, and charged the group of bandits. The bandits were instantly overwhelmed by the brutality of Shao Kahn's strength, power, and overall skills with the wrath hammer. Whoever he didn't hit with the weapon was sent flying back by a massive kick or punch to any bandit that was in his crosshairs. The bandits themselves were surprised, as they didn't expect someone of Shao Kahn's size to move so fast, or to dodge their attacks so easily. Everything Shao Kahn hit, he destroyed in a single blow, and sent many bandits flying back with a few of their limbs missing in the process. This is impossible. Uzumaki Naruto is a weak shrimp, who wears orange, eats ramen, and doesn't know a thing about the world around him. Not this. This. Monster from the pits of hell. Thought Mizuki, as he saw the bandits being slaughtered, and decided to cut his losses by running. Only to find himself pinned to a tree by the should when he was hit by a spear made up of green energy. Crying out in pain, Mizuki tried to free himself from the tree, but couldn't remove it, and saw Shao Kahn had just slammed his foot right through the bandit leader's chest with a sickening crunch. Echoing throughout the area. By this point, Mizuki had decided to actually look at Giant Man to see his overall appearance. Uzumaki Naruto or Shao Kahn as he now called himself was wearing a loin cloth, covered by some cloth in the from while at the sides had side almost reptilian looking armor plating that went down to the hips. He had spiked shoulder pads, similarly designed knee pads and gauntlets, and a skull medallion embedded in two straps that intersect across his chest. Mizuki looked at the man's face and saw the former Kayubi brat no longer had his recognizable blonde hair or blue eyes. He was in fact bald with a slightly demonic face featuring red eyes and small spikes protruding from his head that made Mizuki shiver in fear. It only increased when Shao Kahn walked slowly toward him with bloodlust clearly showing in his eyes. How does it feel Mizuki? How does it feel to be on the receiving end of pain? How does it feel to be the weak sniveling worm wiggling around in pain at the hands of your enemy and receiving no mercy? Pain is no longer fun for you, is it fool? You more than once beat Uzumaki Naruto within an inch of his life any chance you got. You laughed at his suffering. How does it feel to be the one being laughed at? Mocked Shao Kahn before grabbing Mizuki by the face and slammed his head back against the tree. Hard. In fact, it was hard enough to that the impact embedded Mizuki's head in deep within the tree trunk by several inches. What is he? Even for a demon, he shouldn't be this strong. The Yandaimi himself told the village that the demon would never regain a fraction of its lost power so long as he lived, thought Mizuki while struggling with his free hand to grasp the massive wrist connected to the massive hand putting pressure on his head. You can feel it. Can't you Mizuki? Closing in around you? The inky darkness seeping in while life leaves your body. I have felt that many times in my life. Some of them by your hands. Other times by Konoha shinobi and civilians thinking they have a right to rip into my flesh with their weapons of choice. Now you will know Mizuki. Now you will know what it means to suffer. As I have suffered, said Shao Kahn while Mizuki whimpered in fear while pleading with the former emperor of Outworld with his eyes. Mercy. Mercy. Pleaded Mizuki behind the giant hand while Shao Kahn's grin left his face and it turned into one of pure fury. Mercy. You dare ask me for mercy. How many times did Uzumaki Naruto beg for mercy when he was attacked? Huh? You and the other fools in Konoha laughed at him. Look at the demon begging for mercy. Look how the demon cries from the pain we are putting him through. Why should I show someone like you an ounce of mercy, knowing you wouldn't do the same in my place? Tell me. Demanded Shao Kahn while Mizuki was panicking and sweating heavily. Because you want to rise above your enemies offered Mizuki while Shao Kahn's face once more sporting an evil grin. Rise above my enemies. Why rise above my enemies? When I can just crush them into the ground so I will always be above them? Asked Shao Kahn while Mizuki's fear had now increased a hundredfold. The entire area was soon filled with screams, as Shao Kahn unleashed his fury, his rage, and built up aggression against one of the many targets the former emperor of Outworld planned on destroying in the years to come. When he finished hours later, Shao Kahn left the mangled corpse of a horrified-looking Mizuki for the animals to eat, and walked back to the heart of the bandits' camp. Looking around, the demonic man found himself a large brown cloak of sorts, and wrapped it around his body before sealing away the spoils of the bandits' thievery. With his father no doubt telling the rest of Konoha about his return and what he looked like, 
Shao Kahn knew his current attire would quickly turn the heads of the people around him before someone from Jiraiya's spy network informed the Toad Sanin of his location. So for now, he would simply be a large figure in a crowd. But first, Shao Kahn needed to head for Wave Country immediately. His true home in this realm needed to be defended. Shao Kahn made his way to Wave Country at a quick, but moderate pace while walking on the road to the home he always wanted. His brown cloak covered his entire body and using some ropes tied around his waist, he made it seem like he was just a simple monk or priest of some order despite his overly large size. No one would question him on the matter and he could always lie if asked what order he came from. If worse came to worse he could call himself a shadow priest of Outworld. No one knew what Outworld was and he could easily lie and say it was a faraway kingdom. Which it was. His former kingdom to be exact. After what seemed like hours, Shao Kahn stopped at a hill along the path to see the once great Naruto bridge had been changed into the great Uchiha Sasuke bridge. And boy was it different from what it had been when Shao Kahn had been that naive blonde hair, blue-eyed boy named Naruto. The overall structure was the same, but now the bridge was sporting poles in the front, the middle, and end of the bridge with flags at the top. Each pole had a different colored flag on it with each flag sporting either the Uchiha fan symbol, Konoha's leaf symbol, or the Namikaze clan symbol. The middle of the bridge on either side of it now sported a statue of Uchiha Sasuke himself in an arrogant manner of superiority. Like he was a god that deserved to be worshipped and feared like one while hoping he would bless rather than curse you for being within speaking distance of him. What a pompous ass. At least my statues were worth admiring and some were magically enhanced to defend my palace, thought Shao Kahn while heading to the bridge, but was stopped by a group of Konoha shinobi, and it was clear they were cautious of his sudden appearance. As they should be given who they were stopping. Hold. Who are you? Asked Genma if what Shao Kahn remembered from the Chunin exams with the man having a Senban needle in his mouth. I am a simple monk seeking a place to rest from my weary travels. Judging by the way you are so cautious of my presence, I have come at bad time, replied Shao Kahn under his disguise while fighting back the urge to kill these Konoha shinobi with just his bare hands. No not really. It's just the land you are about to enter has just fallen to fire country and there is word of unrest. You may enter, but be mindful of the populace being unfriendly to outsiders, and our own forces occupying it. While I don't believe you will cause any problems, you will be closely watched by our shinobi and ask that you not cause trouble while here, explained Genma with Shao Kahn nodding behind his robed hood. I understand. I will not make waves where they are unwanted, replied Shao Kahn with some of the shinobi around him let out a chuckle. Not make waves. That's a good one considering what the name of the country here used to be called before we took it over, said Genma before slapping Shao Kahn on the arm before wincing and shaking his hand like he had just punched steel. Sorry about that. Like my size suggests, I am well muscled, and capable of defending myself. However, I am also facially disfigured, and will need to keep my hood over my face to ensure I don't upset any children that cross my way, explained Shao Kahn while seeing Genma nodding in understanding. I understand. Though you might want to stay away from the new execution ground we set up since we are going to be using it soon, warned Genma with Shao Kahn narrowing his eyes behind his hood. Oh. Why? Who is meeting their end in the cycle of life? Asked Shao Kahn while seeing Genma's smirk growing. Just finishing off this goody goody family that ironically hired out to us years ago to protect the bridge builder named Tazuna, who built this massive thing behind us. The old geezer led the charge against Konoha when we told these demon lovers to change the name of the bridge to what it is now. He and his family wouldn't listen to reason like the rest of the populace, so we had the old man killed two years ago. We're finishing off his daughter and grandson in a few days using the very same execution grounds the business tycoon Gato once used when he ruled here, said Genma with the hooded figure nodding. I see. I might visit the execution grounds during the day they are to die. If only to say a small prayer for them. I trust they are not being harmed before the execution. The sight of them harmed or injured before their deaths could make the crowd go. Wild with rage replied Shao Kahn and felt his own rage rising within him while standing here. No we have them properly restrained and sedated for the most part. The boy, Inari I think his name is, has become more resistant to the drugs. I think he suspects something and doesn't eat as much of the food laced with the stuff put in it, answered Genma with the robed figure nodding. I'll be going then. 
Thank you for your time, replied Shao Kahn before bowing slightly and walked across the bridge with the shinobi around him giving his body the needed space. Nice guy, remarked one Konoha shinobi wearing a chunin vest. Yeah. I just wish his body wasn't so massive. Hurt my hand on his arm when I gave him that friendly hit, remarked Genma before wincing when he felt his hand throb and the other leaf shinobi laughed. They had no idea who or what they just let through. As for Shao Kahn, he was so tempted to summon his wrath hammer, and smash down everything that supported Konoha. From the statues of Sasuke, to the poles holding the flags, and finally the leaf shinobi hiding. Or like to think they were hiding. Not all of them were lurking in the shadows. Some stood out in public arrogantly, almost like they were saying, I'm so strong I don't need to hide from the likes of you weaklings, to the native populace. Such arrogance. Shao Kahn ignored the Konoha shinobi watching him with watchful eyes among the people of Wave, who didn't look happy in the slightest, but were showing signs of depression like they did when Gato was around. The only real difference between then and now was the people were not starving for food, but it was clear that might change with the way things were going with the leaf shinobi possibly taking the majority of the town's food to keep themselves well fed while here. It made sense, as they would only get stronger physically while the people of Wave withered, and for those that did not submit in time, would die. Stopping at a nearby shop, Shao Kahn entered to find it was a shop filled with weapons, and he was surprised that such a shop was still open. Considering Wave was now under the occupation of Konoha shinobi, it would stand to reason such a shop would be closed, or confiscated by the enemy for the supplies it held. Can I help you, said an elderly man behind the counter. I'm curious about your stores, choice of wares, replied Shao Kahn with the elderly man smirking. And the fact it exists while Wave Country has been invaded by the Konoha scum that killed our hero, added the elderly man. That too. How is this possible? You don't seem like a shinobi and there is no genjutsu on your shop said Shao Kahn with the elderly man's smirk not leaving. Simple. They let me keep my shop, answered the elderly man. Why? Asked Shao Kahn while wondering if this man was a fire country loyalist. Because I don't sell my goods to the people here. Not officially anyway. They agreed to let me keep my shop open on the condition that I don't sell to my fellow countrymen. I sell my goods to anyone loyal to Konoha, fire country or someone else they allow to enter the country so long as what I make them isn't a weapon to be used against Konoha shinobi, replied the elderly man while Shao Kahn nodded behind his hood. So as long as you don't sell a weapon to a citizen of Wave Country or a third party not part of Konoha's military force they leave you alone, surmised Shao Kahn with the man in front of him nodding. That's about sums it up. Now before I try to sell anything to you, I need to ask the one of the following questions. Are you a citizen of Wave Country? questioned the old man. No, replied Shao Kahn. So you are a third party in these lands? In that case, are you looking to buy a weapon to possibly use against Konoha shinobi? asked the old man curiously. No, replied Shao Kahn. Really? That's a shame. Well since you aren't going to buy weapons, I suggest you look around, and see if anything catches your fancy, said the old storekeeper while his soon-to-be possible customer looked around. Now that you mention it, I was actually curious about something regarding your wares, and hoping your answer is the one I get, replied Shao Kahn while looking over some of the items in stock. What is that? asked the old man curiously. Do you do custom jobs? Did you make any of these? asked Shao Kahn with the old man nodding. Yeah. I did quite a bit of work back in the day. Some of these are pretty old, but in good shape, and I can still make some good items if I know what the customer wants, replied the elder shopkeeper. Good. I have something I want you to make for me. Do you have something I could use to draw and show you exactly what I want? Offered Shao Kahn with the man nodding and producing a pencil and drawing parchment before the massive giant began drawing what he wanted. The old man whistled at the design when handed to him. That's one scary looking helmet, commented the old shopkeeper. It's a drawing of the exact same one I had until recently with a few minor modifications. It was damaged in a fight with a stronger opponent. Can you make it? replied Shao Kahn with the old shopkeeper looking at it with a critical eye. Well, I have half of what I need in the back if I use part of a samurai helmet I got from Iron Country. Good quality too. None of that cheap stuff either. This front part along the face area looks like it's bone, which I don't have, 
nor the kind of bone you would probably want that has the strength to endure any punishment it might receive in a fight. The only thing I can really do is use heavy compressed steel in its place, which would take time in putting together in this design to make given my old age. But, I think I can get it ready for you in say about. Dot two. Maybe three days tops. Provided of course, I don't have any other customers seeking my services for a custom job, answered the old man with Shao Kahn nodding and went to a ceiling scroll behind his robes and brought out a large bag filled with lots of gold coins that overflowed once opened. All of this is yours. If you make it with the finest materials and get it to me three days or less from now, replied Shao Kahn with the old man looking shocked at the sight of such wealth. That is a. A lot of money. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you aren't your average monk or priest. Are you? said the old shopkeeper. I never said I was either of those things, countered Shao Kahn. True. You just wear robes so I assumed you were, replied the old man. Can you make it in the time I require? asked Shao Kahn with the old man nodding. I have the materials. Some of the best around. After the bridge was first built, business in wave country went through the roof, and I got in on the ground floor. I have quality stuff in the back that would suit your needs just fine replied the old shopkeeper while Shao Kahn nodded. Here's your payment. Half now. Half later upon completion, replied Shao Kahn while taking out half of what was in the bag if not a little bit more than intended before closing it back up. I'll close up shop so I can get to work on this right away. Where do I find you when it's finished? Asked the old shopkeeper curiously. Do you know Tazuna and his family? Asked Shao Kahn with the old man nodding. Yeah. Great family. Tazuna was an old drinking buddy of mine. Before he died. Why? Questioned the elderly man. I'll be staying at their house. Provided it's still standing, answered Shao Kahn with the old man looking serious. Tsunami and Inari are being detained. They are scheduled for execution in three days. I don't mind a heavy paying customer, but if you are going to live in their home while they suffer, then I will respectfully decline making this for you, and taking your money too, said the old shopkeeper who believed in principles, and wasn't about to forsake a good old friend along with his family so someone could live in their house while he made a strange demonic-looking helmet. You misunderstand. I was a good friend to Zuna and I would like to think I still am a good friend to Tsunami and Inari. Even if it has been many years we last saw each other when the bridge was finally finished, replied Shao Kahn while the old shopkeeper now narrowed his eyes. The day the bridge was finished was when the people of Wave Country said goodbye to that Konoha team Tazuna hired. You couldn't possibly have been there, countered the elderly man. Oh but I was there. I was there to see Inari cry tears of joy. Rather than tears of sorrow, replied Shao Kahn with the shopkeeper's eyes widen, but narrow again while trying to pierce the shadows of the hood. Only the people of Wave Country and that team of Konoha Shinobi know about that. You aren't the silver-haired cyclops or that pompous ass Uchiha. You're certainly not that pink-haired eyesore of a girl who was said to screech should someone insult the Uchiha. The old shopkeeper accused while in his mind a sliver of hope on who this was began to form. Leaving only one other person, said Shao Kahn before letting out a chuckle behind his hooded robes and it made the shopkeeper's eyes widen at the unspoken answer. That boy died. Painfully. Konoha said as much. They ripped his body to shreds and was said to have been burned until there was nothing but ashes left to be scattered into the winds, accused the old man with Shao Kahn shaking his head no. Reports of my demise were greatly exaggerated. I did not die. I endured. I survived. I changed with the environment. I walked through fire, death, battles, wars, and chaos itself. I have done so many things in my time away. Things you could not even begin to imagine. But now I have returned and I intend to get my revenge on those who betrayed me that day, replied Shao Kahn with the old shopkeeper nodding with wide eyes. I believe you. I can hear it in your voice. You are him. Our hero has returned to us. At long last, exclaimed the old man with joy. I will save Tsunami and Inari from their impending death. But I will need your help do it by making this helmet. When I fight to free them, this helmet will be an instrument to bring about fear and terror to the hearts of my enemies. Before I rip said hearts out with my bare hands, explained Shao Kahn with the old shopkeeper nodding. I'll get right on this. Hell, I'll even do it for free, offered the old man, but the giant man in robes shook his head. While I am pleased by the offer, 
It is only fair I compensate you for your time, replied Shao Kahn with the old shopkeeper nodding. All right. Just. Killed that one Junin guarding the bridge with that needle in his mouth. He was the one who Tazuna. I saw it myself, stated the old shopkeeper. The Junin is already dead. He just doesn't know it yet. See you in a few days old man, replied Shao Kahn before leaving the shop to find the home of the family that treated him like a person. Tazuna's house. The home was just like the former Konoha Shinobi turned former emperor of Outworld remembered it after all these years. He was a bit surprised to see it standing though, as the Konoha Shinobi, who killed Tazuna, and took his family let it stand. Shao Kahn theorized that they did this because they weren't ready to destroy it just yet or they were going to hold onto the land around the house for some snooty fire country noble to buy before tearing it down or perform renovations. Whatever the case, it was his temporary home now until he could free Tsunami and Inari from their intended execution a few days from now. He would need those days to prepare himself, see where his strength level was at, and what exactly he had at his disposal. Shao Kahn knew right away the answer to his question was his powers, his speed, strength, and the agility it possessed despite his overall size. The Wrathhammer, which he had used on many occasions was in his hand now, the blood from the bandits killed still somewhat fresh, and needed to be cleaned off. Walking into the home, the former emperor of Outworld looked around, seeing signs of a struggle had happened in this house when the leaf shinobi came. Some blood was on the wall and floor. A broken glass and plate were on the ground not far. Kanai and shuriken holes proving the weapons were thrown here. Shao Kahn would definitely see to it that those leaf shinobi here, currently occupying the land of wave country suffered greatly. Oh yes. They were going to suffer greatly indeed. Execution grounds three days later, a robed figure, looking like a large yet humble monk, or priest with his hood on was walking toward the area where two people were going to die today. A young teenage boy and his mother. He heard the growing crowd behind the fence where the executions were going to happen. The people were getting into a frenzy. They were shouting, spitting, and cursing the Konoha shinobi behind the fence at the injustice of it all. The robed figure merely stood back, watching things from behind the mob, as he saw a Konoha Junin currently standing between the two soon-to-be-executed people. When the robed figure looked at the Junin, he instantly went ramrod straight, and instantly knew who this person was despite the years away. So they made him Junin now. Hard to imagine. I guess with his success in betraying my trust and hating me for years must have warranted the fool to get promoted, thought the figure while clenching his hands into fists. Amino Aruka. Former Chunin and Konoha Academy instructor of the Leaf. And beside him. Special Junin and his lover Mitarashi Anko. The woman was wearing the same damn thing she always wore. Trench coat, fishnet shirt, and short skirt that did little to hide her female form. Let's get this show on the road Aruka. We have a schedule to keep, barked Anko while Aruka nodding and moved to address the angry crowd while Leaf Shinobi were forming a line of defense should the fence set up to keep the people back was knocked down by the protesting populace. People of what was once wave country. We are here today to carry out an execution in the name of justice, declared Aruka while the crowd got angry. Justice? More like injustice, protested one person in the crowd. These two criminals have been found guilty of crimes against Konoha, its Hokage, and Fire Country as a whole, continued Aruka and saw the fence being shaken. You're the criminals. You invaded our home. You're no better than Gado, protested a second person. For refusing a simple request and loving an evil demon, it has been decided that in order to save the souls of these two people, they must be put to death, concluded Aruka and the crowd got even more rowdy. Murderers, yelled a third, backstabbers, cried out a fourth. You are the real demons and monsters. Naruto was a hero to the people of Wave, and you had him murdered because he wouldn't be your pawn like my dad Kaiza. Like my grandfather, came a voice that was surprisingly from Inari and those among the crowd heard it was making the mob of people very rowdy. You sealed your fate boy. Kill him first commanded Aruka with the anbu in front of Inari and kneeing him in the gut before bringing out his tanto. No. Someone do something, protested Tsunami, as she had been silent the entire, but to see her only child about to die was too much, and it brought back the memory of when she along with Inari were saved by Naruto. But Naruto was gone. No one could save them again. Before the masked anbu could do anything, 
A spear of green energy flew through the fence, hit the Konoha shinobi straight in the chest, and sent the man flying several feet before stopping dead. In that moment, all protests, shouts, and orders from everyone went silent at what was just witnessed by everybody there. Following the trajectory of the projectile, everyone soon turned their heads to the large, robed, and hood-covered figure with his arm currently outstretched like he had thrown a spear or javelin. I think it's time someone put you Konoha Shinobi in your place. Somewhere underneath the soil and dirt seems appropriate, remarked the robed figure while walking forward and the mob of people let him without protest. You have some balls to do that. I'm going to enjoy cutting them off before killing you alongside our victims, said Anko with a grin and Kanai in hand. The robed figure said nothing. Just stood in front of the fence for a moment and some of the people wondered if the man behind the robes lost his nerve. That line of thought was shot down when a pair of large hands from within the robes grabbed the fence and tore it apart like it was tissue paper. Stepping through, the figure found himself surrounded on all sides by Konoha Shinobi with their swords, and Kanai drawn for battle. Care to tell us your name before you die here today? Asked Aruka with the figure letting out a cruel laugh that echoed throughout the area. Telling you my name wouldn't matter. After today, almost all of you here won't be alive long enough to speak it, let alone tell your pathetic Hokage about my existence, replied the figure while Leaf Shinobi bristled and tensed with anger. Kill him. Commanded Anko with the Konoha Shinobi around her moving swiftly to kill the fool that insulted the Gondame Hokage. No one expected the figure to move so fast, given his size, and rough outlined shape with the heavy robes of a monk or priest. But they underestimated him and it cost the attackers dearly, as he clothesline one shinobi, spun on his heel, dodging a tonto to the back before kneeing another one, and backhanded the second attacker who tried to stab him with the sword. Seeing her chance, Anko used her many hidden shadow snake hands to try and trapping the cloaked figure. But she was caught by surprise when the figure dodged the line of snakes before grabbing them all swiftly with his cloaked arm, and crushed them with his clearly superior strength. Sealed bomb square release! exclaimed Aruka, as he had used this time to prepare this attack and trap the enemy within this quite literally explosive prison before killing him. Looks like we win, remarked Anko confidently with a smirk on her face. And how do you figure that? questioned the robed figure. This is a barrier seal of sorts. A deadly one. See Aruka over there. One hand sign from him and your barrier becomes a bomb. One that will destroy you. If you try to move, you get the same result, and your remains go flying, explained Anko with the figure looking around to see the Konoha shinobi he knocked down were starting to get up, but were badly injured from each hit. Is this supposed to mean something? Your little attempt to frighten me into surrendering? To beg for mercy? questioned the unafraid figure while Anko's smirk lessened over the fact this guy wasn't begging for mercy. Considering the alternative as being dead and in multiple pieces, replied Anko, as she walked toward him, but stopped when the figure let out a cruel chuckle. You and that fool Uruka underestimate me. Konoha Shinobi always did when I was there as a child, remarked the figure before surprising everyone and walking toward Anko. Before the seals went off and the explosion covering the area with enough force to send Konoha Shinobi along with some of the populace of Wave Country flying back. When the smoke cleared, everyone saw that the figure was surprisingly standing unharmed. His robes were charred, burned, tattered, and ready to fall off while blowing against a sudden wind. He shouldn't be standing. That should have killed him, exclaimed Aruka in shock while the figure walked out of the smoke and slowly grabbed the tattered destroyed robes on his body before ripping them off. Honestly, I expected more out of you Aruka. Apparently, your skills are not worthy of the promotion to Junin like I first thought, mocked the figure before summoning a large sledgehammer to his hand out of nowhere. How did he summon a weapon? Asked one of the injured Anbu while seeing it appear almost out of nowhere. And why do you talk to me as if I've met you before? I don't know you, said Aruka with the massive figure of seemingly solid muscle walking toward him and Anko. You once gave me something under the false pretense of friendship. Before that, you hated me for something that another did, and who I was connected to since the day I was born. Ring any bells now, hinted the figure while Aruka narrowed his eyes, but Anko's was clearly piecing things together much faster than him, and it was clear she'd figure it out soon. I've never hated anyone from Konoha in my life. Not even Mizuki when he betrayed the village, said Aruka with the figure stopping and frowned at him behind the mask while crimson red eyes glowed angrily. 
Look into my eyes Aruka. Don't they have a familiar look to them? The ones you saw as a child. The ones you saw while your parents were being killed that night. Exclaimed the figure and smiled again when Aruka's eyes widened in surprise before it slowly dawned on the man. No. No it's impossible, it's impossible. Whispered Aruka in denial while his breathing had now gone heavy with shock and horror all over his face. What? What is it Aruka? demanded Anko while she stared between them with confusion if only a slight bit of it. You still don't recognize me. And here I thought the crazy snake bitch would piece it all together by now before Aruka did. Clearly, the only thing you are good for is spreading your legs for Aruka. Just like Mizuki said. Right before I killed him with my bare hands, mocked the figure while Anko and Aruka looked shocked. You killed Mizuki? When? demanded Aruka angrily with the figure smirking at him. A few days ago not far from Wave Country. He was aiding a group of bandits in raiding a caravan of its riches and said quite a few choice words about you too. Before I killed him, answered the figure and it was clear Aruka wasn't taking it well. You monster. You demon. I should have just let Mizuki kill you in the forest when he had the chance back then, exclaimed Aruka before drawing his weapon in anger. And risk the real demon escaping from my body. As much as you hated me for being a living prison Aruka. We both know you hated the idea of Kayubi getting out even more, replied the figure with Aruka gritting his teeth and Anko's eyes going wide in shock before she got into a more deadlier fighting stance. Uzumaki Naruto, for abandoning your duties to Konoha, and threatening its stability you are to be put to death, ordered Anko with the people behind the giant man looking at him in shock that their hero had returned. Almost instantly the crowd behind him roared to life, calling out to protect their hero, to quickly overpower the Konoha shinobi with their greater numbers. Stay where you are. This is my fight and mine alone, commanded the giant man firmly with the people of Wave looking surprised by the order. Why? We want to help you. To repay you for all you've done, protested one person. You deserve our help. Added another person. We can help you take down these pieces of Konoha trash together cried out a third while the people were getting more rowdy. Do as I say. If anyone is going to take down these piece of Konoha trash, it will be me, commanded the giant of a man before walking forward. Not too bright Gaki. You may have gotten bigger and packing more muscle, but you are still the same klutzy dim-witted Uzumaki Naruto that didn't know a pencil from a kanai growing up, said Enko mockingly while the figure in front of her began generate a lot of power. Then you need your eyes checked. I'm no longer Uzumaki Naruto. Konoha was able to successfully kill him years ago through the power of their so-called, will of fire, it has embraced since its founding. I am what he became from the ashes of that fire. You may call me, Shao Kahn, replied Shao Kahn before he moved in a blur of speed and was hit by a shoulder tackle that sent her into one of the wooden poles used to hold tied up soon to be executed criminals. Anko, called out Aruka. But Shao Kahn was in front of him in a second, and backhanded the former Chunin Academy instructor with his free hand turned fist. Down already? From one hit. Don't make me laugh Aruka. Clearly you are no more a Junin level shinobi than you were a Chunin level shinobi all those years ago if all your strength fails you now. And only after one hit no less, mocked Shao Kahn while walking toward him, but was stopped when the group of Konoha shinobi from before stood in his way along with what appeared to be additional reinforcements. We heard the explosion and knew it wasn't standard execution ground policy, replied Genma with his team and saw the figure that was Shao Kahn turning to face him with an evil grin on his face. Prepare to die Konoha Shinobi. For this day will be your last, exclaimed Shao Kahn with his power swirling around him like a vortex and making his enemies very uneasy. What is he? Genma asked Aruka, who was trying to stand. It's the Kayubi Jinchuriki. It's Uzumaki Naruto exclaimed Aruka with the shinobi who came as reinforcements looking shocked before preparing for battle. All your souls are now mine, exclaimed Shao Kahn before charging forward and began to unleash his fury on the shinobi in front him not prepared for the battle that they had just walked into. Seeing her comrades getting butchered, Anko quickly summoned a large snake, one the size of a horse to be exact, and commanded it to charge Shao Kahn. She was hoping that it would kill him or at least weaken the monster with its deadly poison. Shao Kahn saw the snake coming out of the corner of his eye and swung his wrath hammer horizontally into the side of the snake's face. 
The end result was the head exploding and killing the snake in a violent display of gore showering everyone around him. The Konoha shinobi around him tried to gang up on him at once, but Shao Kahn hit one with a flying knee, smashed the skull of another's in two with the wrath hammer, used the bottom of the pointed hilt of said wrath hammer to stab another in the eye, and killing two shinobi for the price of one with a well-timed fireball of his own. Sensing someone sneaking up behind him, Shao Kahn spun around, and saw it was Genma with his Senban needle out to strike a spot in his neck if hit could paralyze his target. Acting quickly, the former emperor of Outworld grabbed Genma by the throat with his free hand, and violently snapped the man's neck before tossing him away like yesterday's trash. Die! 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 exclaimed Aruka, as he managed to sneak to the top of the wooden pole that held prisoners for execution and jumped down on the back of Shao Kahn before repeatedly stabbing him with a kanai in the chest area while holding on for dear life. It might have worked too if not for the energy shield that blocked each stabbing long enough for Shao Kahn to reach back, grab Iruka, and slam him into the ground before putting his large sandaled foot on the man's torso. The impact from the foot broke a few ribs and making the scarred Junin cry out in pain, which got worse when Shao Kahn applied more pressure to it. Iruka! exclaimed Anko, as she moved to make a few hand signs for a jutsu but was stopped at the time by a spear of light hitting the side of her torso too fast for the special Junin to dodge yet kept her pinned to the wooden pole. You bastard! exclaimed Aruka, as he tried to reach for the kanai he lost when his enemy grabbed him, and slammed his body into the ground. And what if I am? What does that make my so-called parents? My so-called sister? Not that I care since they will soon be dead just like you are about to be real soon replied Shao Kahn before getting ready to stomp the man's chest in. No. Don't kill him. I beg of you, pleaded Anko while Shao Kahn looked at her right in the eyes before a loud crunch echoed around the execution grounds. Amino Iruka was dead. A look of pain and horror showing on his face at having his life end so violently in such a way. The sound that followed was Mitarashi Anko's wails of sadness and sorrow at losing the man she loved with all her heart while crying her eyes out. As she did, Shao Kahn walked over to her, but on the way, the man freed Tsunami, and Inari from the ropes that bound them to the poles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, exclaimed Tsunami, as she hugged Shao Kahn, and Inari doing the same. I knew you were alive big brother. I knew you wouldn't let Konoha win, exclaimed Inari with Shao Kahn letting out a chuckle. We have much to talk about in the near future. Go home. I'll be there soon. Right after I deal with this one here, said Shao Kahn while pointing his wrath hammer at Anko and began walking toward her. Not one to argue with him, Tsunami, Inari, and the people of Wave Country left knowing their hero's judgment on this matter was absolute. Kill me, whispered Anko when Shao Kahn was standing right in front of her. Care to repeat that? asked Shao Kahn with a hint of amusement. I said kill me. Kill me now. Kill me right fucking now demanded Anko before glaring up at him with tear-stained eyes. Why? Because you want me to kill you? Because you want to take the easy way out? Or because you want to join your beloved Aruka in hell? Questioned Shao Kahn with the woman glaring at him with tears running down her face. It's because I refuse to be anything else while you are still alive! exclaimed Anko with some show of defiance while Shao Kahn laughed. You put up a brave front. But I can see into your soul. You are afraid deathly afraid of me of what i can do to konoha to fire country but more importantly to you and you know what replied shao khan as he grabbed her by the wound while the light spear dispelled itself and heard her scream out in pain what exclaimed anko while being lifted off the ground and slammed into the pole with just that one arm with his helmet covered face directly in front of her you are right to be afraid of me very afraid I am out for revenge against everyone who betrayed me. You, Aruka, the rookies, their Junin senseis, my parents, my godparents, the Sandame, and everyone else that hurt me all those years ago, replied Shao Kahn with Anko gritting her teeth in pain when he dug his hand into her torso. I was only following. Orders, protested Anko before crying out in pain. A lie and an excuse to justify your reason, not that it matters. I have lived long enough under the heel of those giving and following orders. No more. You and Ibiki did quite a number on me when I was being questioned. 
I told you the truth and you wouldn't let up. I can still remember your laughter in the darkness of my prison cell as you cut into my flesh. You weren't doing it because of orders or to get the real truth from me. You were doing it because you wanted to do it. My pain was your so-called redemption in the eyes of Konoha. My suffering was your freedom. You knew that if I suffered greatly by your hands, people would think your loyalty to Konoha was absolute, and being alone for the rest of your life would be a thing of the past. I was actually surprised you would sink so low and betray yourself like that. Especially when it came to me. We both suffered at the hands of the village, but for different reasons, yet we were practically in the same damn boat. Only, you jumped for a new life when offered the chance, and left me stranded to die in what soon became a sinking ship, countered Shao Kahn while Anko grabbed the arm holding her in place, trying to push it away so the pressure of his hand wouldn't be so painful, but he only pressed harder, and she screamed out while more tears left her eyes. I was tired. All right? I admit it. I was tired of the hatred. Of the pain. I was offered a chance and I took it. Yandaimi Sama, Sandame Sama, Jiraiya Sama, and Tsunade Sama came to me before your assigned interrogation with the offer to change public support in my favor. The Yandaimi explained he could vouch for me, saying that I was not under Orochimaru's influence at all, and he could get Orochimaru to admit it as well when he came back to the village's fold. All I had to do was make you suffer. It didn't matter if you were telling the truth or not. They just said to make you suffer for the beating you gave the Uchiha. To take out my aggressions out on you knowing it would be my ticket to being loved and having a life with someone special to me. A someone you just killed. Confessed Anko with the last part causing her to glare at him. Only to be pulled toward him for a second and then slammed once again into the wooden pole with enough force to cause it to break slightly where she hit it. Don't get so high and mighty with me. You are nothing more than a hypocrite. Uzumaki Naruto wouldn't have left you to die alone if roles were reversed. He would have fought tooth and nail to ensure you had happiness. Unlike you, he kept his principles to the end, and never betrayed anyone for anything. No matter the offer, exclaimed Shao Kahn in a furious tone and saw blood leak out of Anko's mouth. You speak as if Uzumaki Naruto is dead, but we both know you are Uzumaki Naruto, countered Anko with Shao Kahn grinning at her. No Uzumaki Naruto died soon after his escape and was reborn through the powers of dark magic and sorcery. You are correct in regards that the soul may be alive, but the body is dead, and I am now Shao Kahn. Do not confuse the two of us just because we are in one body, explained Shao Kahn while Anko bit back the urge to cry out in pain. If you say so, and you call me a hypocrite, said Anko with her clearly not believing his words. Perhaps I am in a way but it's minor when compared to you, and that cesspool you call a shinobi village. I'm looking forward to crushing everyone in Konoha under my power when the time comes, and you are going to help me, remarked Shao Kahn with Anko glaring at him. After what you just did. I'd rather die, protested Anko, as she cried out when he put a lot more pressure on the wound, and nearly blacked out. That's an option I'm more than willing to follow through with wench. However, given your talents as a shinobi, I think you would be better put to use as one of my many new subordinates. Maybe I'll even make you my bodyguard or concubine if I wish, replied Shao Kahn while Anko growled angry. As if I would ever have sex with you, I won't. I'd rather be an old hag with saggy tits, exclaimed Anko before she found herself stripped of her trench coat, her fishnet shirt had been ripped off, and pressed up against the wooden pole before she even react. I told you and the others before they died that your soul was mine. Everything you are now belongs to me, declared Shao Kahn, as he held her in place, and put a hand on the infamous curse seal he knew had always been the bane of her existence, from what his memories of the thing had been for the woman. Ignoring Anko's attempts to fight him off from her position, Shao Kahn began to analyze the curse seal using his power, and in a matter of moments, attacked it. Such a big man. Having to rape an injured woman to feel big. I bet you're tiny underneath that loincloth. Your path ah, was all Anko could get out in a mocking tone, as she screamed out in pain when she suddenly felt a stabbing sensation attacking the curse seal on her neck. The poor woman began to spasm, as she felt something being pulled out of her, and then something entering in its place. She didn't know what it was that entered, but Anko feared that whatever her old sensei had put into the curse seal to make it bind her to him, Shao Kahn had replaced it with something worse. Whatever he had done, she didn't want but her strength had left her body, and couldn't fight him off. 
His grip on her shoulder was a vice and the other hand on her hip kept any spasm she had from getting out of control. Funny thing I learned about the curse seal on your neck. It's designed to hold a piece of someone's soul. This is done in combination with elements I have never seen before of a biological nature to draw on the energies of nature itself to sustain it. Fortunately for me, the power to drain a soul, if only a fragment of it, has always been a skill I was a natural at when reborn in Outworld. Without the soul fragment, your body could not sustain itself due to the other elements being rejected, and thus needs another soul fragment to anchor it down, explained Shao Kahn before he released the woman when he finished and saw her fall to the ground exhausted. You. You put a piece of yourself into the curse seal, concluded Anko after a moment in regaining her bearings while looking up at him in horror. Yes. Just as that curse seal bound you to Orochimaru, so does mine in a similar fashion though the design is clearly different, replied Shao Kahn before picking up a kanai near him and lightly tossed it to Anko so she could use it as a mirror to see the seal through the metal. Instantly, Anko felt new found strength at this opportunity to attack Shao Kahn and took it with speed she didn't know was possible for someone so drained of energy. Maybe it was her rage, her pain of losing Aruka, or the fact she didn't care about dying anymore. However, when she was a second away from plunging the kanai into his chest where the heart was located, Anko's body suddenly jolted like it had been struck by lightning, and the woman cried out in pain before slumping to the ground. W what? What was that? Why couldn't I? I kill you? asked Anko while panting and looking up at the smirking giant. Because my seal won't let you Anko. Your former sensei Orochimaru may have been one to find amusement by entertaining himself with the idea of you getting close enough to kill him, but I do not share his views on the matter. This is your ultimate punishment for betraying me and yourself all those years ago Anko. You will obey me. You follow my every command I give whether you like it or not. From now on, I am you master. From now on, I am your commander. Your emperor. My word is law to you. Decreed Shao Kahn with Anko not liking this one bit. And if I decide to kill myself? Challenged Anko before she felt more pain run through her body. You can try Anko, but like with your attempt to kill me just now, the seal won't let you do anything of the sort, and over time. Dot the seal will make you see things as they were meant to be seen. My way. Answered Shao Kahn while Anko struggled to get up and stand. And what does? What does my, my, my master command of me? Asked Anko while she saw his grin increase further. Simple. You know where every Konoha shinobi in Wave Country is currently located throughout the land. Even now, some of them are going to investigate what has happened here when those sent to investigate what happened in this area fail report in soon. You will be reporting in for them. You will report that a riot was put down after a successful execution of Tsunami and Inari occurred commanded Shao Kahn while Anko grit her teeth, but slowly nodded, and found a radio communication system on one of the dead Konoha shinobi. She didn't dare look at Aruka's body for fear of tears forming again. Teams 3 and 7 report. Anko? Aruka? What's going on over there? We heard and felt a commotion going on at the execution grounds, was a voice over the speaker Anko put in her ear. This is Anko. We had a small riot after we executed the two prisoners. We put down the rioters. All Konoha shinobi can stand down. I repeat. All Konoha shinobi stand down, said Anko into her headset. Copy that Anko. All teams stand down and head back to your posts, said the voice on the other end. I'm going to be off duty for a little while Kakashi. Aruka. Aruka and I need to get all the blood off of our clothes added Anko while seeing Shao Kahn's crimson eyes narrow at the mention of the Cyclops. Understood Anko. Try not to have too much fun or let your guard down while off duty. We might need you too if things get crazy later, replied Kakashi before Anko turned off the radio after hearing the man's perverted giggle. Baka. Whispered Anko before she was turned around by Shao Kahn and forced to look him right in those crimson eyes and felt his hand on her waist before the injury there was healed by his powers. Now. Tell me about the situation overall in Wave Country. From troop positions to their exact numbers and the Wave Daimyo either being alive or dead. Leave nothing out or you will regret it, commanded Shao Kahn with Anko reluctantly nodding and told him everything. Wave Daimyo's castle sometime later, Aruka, Anko, Genma, and their teams haven't reported in yet. Questioned Kakashi with Yamato nodding a yes. 
nor the team assigned to Anko and Aruka during the execution of the two criminals that supported the demon, added Yamato with Kakashi letting out a noise indicating he was thinking. Something has happened to them. Somehow the people of Wave have taken down our teams while they were caught off guard, concluded Kakashi with Yamato frowning in thought. But how? It shouldn't be possible for civilians to take down highly skilled shinobi, said Yamato with Kakashi shrugging. Knowing Anko's ways, the people of Wave probably caught her and Aruka rutting in a cheap motel. As for Genma and his team, we'll just have to find out, replied Kakashi casually, as he was reading his Icha Icha Paradise book while in the daimyo's chair, and glanced at the worried Mokotan user. How? asked Yamato with Kakashi shrugging. Any way we can. They took down our people so we have to return the favor to them. Get in contact with our teams around the town. Have them round up a few random people for execution. And don't stop with just men since they'll put on a brave face. Get some of the women and children too, ordered Kakashi, as he was told to bring this country under the command of Fire Country, and if he had to kill a chunk of the populace to do it, then he would. Besides, Fire Country was planning to invest some of its population here, and would be looking for homes to live in. What better way to do that than kill a few people in wave and seize their houses as spoils of war to redistribute later to wealthy influential families? I just did Kakashi Senpei. I've lost contact with five of the eight teams still out there, replied Yamato with Kakashi frowning now and putting his book away. And the three remaining teams? asked Kakashi with Yamato frowning further. They are all here inside the castle, replied Yamato before an explosion was heard that shook the castle. We're under attack. Attention all Konoha Shinobi, we are under attack. Prepare to repel the enemy. Commanded Kakashi before sounds of fighting were heard, more explosions shook the castle, and cries of pain. Kakashi. We are under attack by an unknown foe. Anko is with him. She's betrayed us. She has ah, cried one Shinobi into his headset. Anko? Betraying us? But that's not possible, exclaimed Yamato with the cries of battle pain, and death getting louder. Another explosion rocked the castle. We will know soon enough, said Kakashi, as he saw the large doors leading into their room getting smashed against something powerful from the way the doors jolted, and the sound of the impact of the thing hitting them. The two Konoha shinobi plus the Anbu with them were watching with weapons drawn as the doors to the throne room started crack, another hit causing a splinter, and another causing them to break. When the broken doors flew open, Kakashi, Yamato, and the Anbu with them were shocked to see a strange man walking into the room. He was dressed like some kind of warlord, a strange demonic samurai helmet on his head that covered the upper part of his face, and head while holding a massive sledgehammer in his hand. Beside him was Mitarashi Anko, wearing her usual trench coat, and short skirt currently stained in blood. Her fishnet shirt was missing, though everyone knew that the shirt did little to hide the impressive bust the woman sported, and teased men with when walking around Konoha. Identify yourself, commanded Kakashi while focusing on the figure and ignoring Anko for the moment. I am Shao Kahn, the conqueror, and you Hitaki Kakashi will be bow to me before the end, proclaimed Shao Kahn with Kakashi raising an eyebrow while looking completely calm while the Anbu around him let out a chuckle. We'll see, replied Kakashi before revealing his Sharingan eye and got ready for a fight. Fight, yelled Shao Kahn as he engaged the Anbu, and Kakashi while Anko took on Yamato. Why are you doing this Anko? You are a loyal Konoha shinobi. Why betray us after the Yandaimi cleared you of being possible traitor? Demanded Yamato while trying to repel her with his sword while she used a kunai. You think I have a choice? The bastard over there reshaped my curse seal to practically make me his slave, said Anko while having no choice in the matter of fighting Yamato. What? How? Orochimaru-sama said your curse seal was untouchable since it was just a prototype and faulty in being used properly, said Yamato with Anko gritting her teeth. I don't know, exclaimed Anko angrily while stilling trying to kill him. Mokaton. Mokasatsu Shibari no Jutsu, said Yamato after leaping back and quickly shot multiple branches from his hands to tie up Anko. As for Shao Kahn, he shoulder tackled one Konoha Anbu right into a stone pillar and leaving a mashed-looking body to slump down dead. Two Anbu leapt into the air with a tanto in their hands, and tried to stab him from above. However, the demonic warlord threw his wrath hammer into the air, 
hitting one of them in the chest with enough force to cave in his ribs, and the second Anbu missed his strike. Shao Kahn caught the second Anbu by the back of his, pulled him back, and broke his spine when ramming a knee right into it with enough force that shattered the means for the man to walk ever again. Not that it mattered since Shao Kahn crushed his head like a grape and threw the body away. Rikiri! exclaimed Kakashi, as he charged forward, and struck his intended target with his lightning jutsu. Only to find some kind of chakra shield was blocking his Rikiri from killing Shao Kahn and got an uppercut to the face after having his extended arm knocked away. Where is your Yandaimi Hokage when you need him Kakashi? mocked Shao Kahn with an amused chuckle before walking toward the stunned man. He hits harder than Tsunade Sama. What is he? thought Kakashi, as he shook his head, but was quickly brought to his feet, and held by his Junin vest by Shao Kahn. Your pathetic Sharingan eye shackles someone like me no longer, replied Shao Kahn before smashing his fist into Kakashi several times before throwing him right into a stone pillar holding the roof up. Kakashi's body bounced off the pillar before hitting the ground hard, his Sharingan eye was being slightly blocked by the swell around it, and bleeding heavily from several cuts made by the spiked wrist bracers. Kakashi Senpei! exclaimed Yamato while wondering how he could help Kakashi in keeping Anko restrained. Someone. Like him? What does he mean by that? thought Kakashi while struggling to get up. You, the Yandaimi, his family, Senju Tsunade and the other higher-ups within Konoha masquerade yourselves as dragons. Believing you have a right to control the world as the elder gods are in control of the heavens. But in end, you are all mere toothless worms, mocked Shao Kahn before grabbing a shocked Kakashi by the back of his vest and threw him against another pillar before being kicked hard into it with enough force to leave an impression of his body in it. You have no right to speak about Minato sensei like that, or anyone from Konoha for that matter protested Kakashi after he fell forward onto the ground. Oh but I do Hitaki Kakashi. The Yandaimi Hokage is my father after all, countered Shao Kahn while Kakashi looked up at him in horror and so did Yamato. F father. But. Dot how. The only child Yandaimi Sama has is Naruko, countered Yamato with Shao Kahn laughing. How quickly the people of Konoha forget, but you didn't forget. Did you Kakashi? The other less loved child, who was your student, which you were assigned to watch, neglect, and ensure the boy would never reach his full potential for fear of what he would do upon learning the truth behind his life's purpose. You know the life that I'm talking about, right Hitaki? The very one where he struggles all day, every day, without end, and when the boy finally succeeds in the one mission given to him by the Hokage, he's put to death, said Shao Kahn with Kakashi still looking at him in horror since the Junin knew who he was from another life. And Naruto, whispered Kakashi since he did remember the promise of revenge aimed at the leaf by the boy who made it before being sucked into that portal. After that happened, Minato, Jiraiya, and Kashina Al tried to study the seal design on the ground that was left behind in the hopes of understanding it to find Naruto. But all the attempts proved fruitless for years due to the design being unreadable and too scorched to be deciphered by anyone. Jiraiya had even tried to reverse summon the boy since he was still bound to the Toad contract, but it didn't work, and what was worse had been the elder Toad talking of the original prophecy changing. Not just changing, but rather it had been destroyed entirely, and being rewoven into something completely different. Jiraiya had said the elder Toad described it like someone took a sword to a tapestry that was the future before the pieces reformed into a new prophecy. It was only now did Kakashi know what it was referring to as it played back in his mind. Gods and kings trembled in fear of his power, his heart filled with rage and pain from the past. He will fight all who stand against him. In the name of justice and vengeance all will fall at his feet. The betrayed one will return to conqueror all we know, and consume the shinobi world as we know it, into shadow. It is a good thing that you remembered my old name after all these years Kakashi. I would hate to think that someone such as yourself forgot about your sensei's discarded son. Now take it with you to the nether realm knowing your life and this world as you know it. Is going to end soon. Very soon, replied Shao Kahn, as he brought his wrath hammer up to crush the man in front of him, and deal another blow to Konoha. Damn it. I need to save Kakashi Senpei, thought Yamato, as he threw Anko against a wall, and turned his jutsu toward Kakashi in order to retrieve him before the killing blow could be delivered down upon him. Thanks Yamato. 
We need to get out of here and to Konoha immediately. They have to be warned, replied Kakashi while Yamato held onto him and they began to flee from the castle. We'll make it Kakashi Senpei. Don't worry, said Yamato while rushing with Kakashi to the bridge, trying to escape using speed to their advantage despite one being riddled with internal injuries. Light Spear. Called out Shao Kahn, as he pierced Yamato's chest, and sent the two leaf shinobi stumbling across the bridge. Yamato. Called out Kakashi while seeing Yamato trying to stand, but the spear shaped chakra weapon had hit the man with lethal precision, and the Mokotan user soon slumped down dead. One less worm to worry about crushing. I remember him from my time growing up as a child. Looking back on it, I realize he used his wood powers to suppress Kyubis from being unleashed on the fools that hurt me growing up. I should have made him suffer more for his past actions, remarked Shao Kahn with Kakashi struggling to stand. But the former emperor punched him in the face, and sent the Junin flying to the side of the bridge into the concrete siding while denting the metal railing. Naruto wait. We. We can work this out. I know. I know Konoha has wronged you for what the Kyubi did. That I wronged you. But it doesn't have to be this way. We can start anew. All of us. You, me, the Sandame, your godparents, your parents, and your sister can all start over. A fresh start. They would be proud to have you back in Konoha and as a member of their family, pleaded a helpless Kakashi while Shao Kahn stopped in front of him with the wrath hammer in his hand once more. And why would I want to be a member of that so-called family? They never wanted me Kakashi. Even after I was born, they never wanted a son. It didn't matter to them if I had the Kyubi sealed in me or not. They would have cast me out simply for being male and for their own selfish reasons. Though in a way, I should thanking them for making me the Kyubi Jinchuriki rather than my sister. If she had been, I know they would have still raised her, and left me to die at the hands of the villagers. They didn't need me. They just didn't want to do the extra work when presented with a way out, countered Shao Kahn before picking up Kakashi and slamming him into railing. That's not true, protested Kakashi while grunting at the pain he was in right now. You knew what they planned for me after I became the Kyubi Jinchuriki. You knew they were going to leave me regardless if I was or not. At least with the fox's power, I was able to heal from my wounds, and enhancing my already fast regenerative abilities given to me by my Uzumaki bloodline because of it. Tell me Kakashi, if my sister had been made a Jinchuriki, and I was cast aside to suffer at the hands of Konoha's populace like I did growing up, would you have let me suffer? Demanded Shao Kahn with the Junin not answering him and looking away. I'm sorry Naruto. But you know Minato Sensei's orders are absolute, and I must obey him since he knows what he's doing. According to Jiraiya, either he or Naruko are to be considered the child of prophecy that was foretold long ago. Add to the fact he was the Yandaimi Hokage of Konoha and single handedly ended the Third Shinobi War with Iwa. Dot one does not question a man like that about his decisions, answered Kakashi before seeing the disgusted look on the giant's helmeted face. Well, I'm questioning him. And I'll have you know, he is not the child of prophecy that was foretold. Nor is Naruko. I am, declared Shao Kahn with Kakashi glaring at him now in anger. Says who? Just because you say it doesn't make it true. You are just a dead last, no talent shinobi, who was given bare minimum training, and learning in order to be a subservient weapon for a cause beyond his understanding. You are a weapon. A tool. Tools do not question their masters countered Kakashi before he cried out in pain when Shao Kahn brought his wrath hammer down on his right kneecap. The elder gods say otherwise, but you don't have to take my word for it. I suggest you go and talk to my so-called father about this. He knows what I just told you is true, said Shao Kahn with Kakashi clutching his broken leg. I don't know how you came to that conclusion, but you must be even stupider than when you escaped Konoha. Do you expect me to believe that I can just wobble out of here to warn everyone without being killed by you with my back turned? I thought you wanted to kill me and everyone else in Konoha? For your revenge? Questioned Kakashi with Shao Kahn laughing at him and leaning down to stare the Junin right in the eyes. Before grabbing half of it, they already know I have returned Kakashi. Or at the very least, the higher ups know of my return. After all, I did rip the other half of Kyubi out of my father and then sent him back to Konoha as weak as a newborn infant, said Shao Kahn while pressing his thumb down on Kakashi's eye holding the Sharingan. Oh no! Our edge against Naruto is gone. 
and with Minato Sensei losing the other half of the Kyubi. Thought Kakashi with Shao Kahn's smile increase as if he were reading the Junin's mind. Oh yes Kakashi. Any advantage Konoha had with my father fighting me is gone. I took back from him what didn't belong to my father from the start. Just as I am going to take what doesn't belong to you either, said Shao Kahn and moved his large hand to painfully remove the Sharingan eye of one Hitaki Kakashi with the man crying out in protest and thrashing wildly in the process. No. Don't. This eye came from a dear friend. It's all I have left of him, pleaded Kakashi while thrashing, punching, kicking Shao Kahn's massive body with no success. Your time being known as Sharingan Kakashi is over. As of this very moment, you are now just plain ordinary Hitaki Kakashi, replied Shao Kahn before showing the eye to the Junin before crushing it in his hands and letting the optic juice from the organ leak out of his fist for Kakashi to see with his one remaining eye. No Obito. Rin. Sasuke, whispered Kakashi in shock. Wobble back to Konoha like the wounded dog you are Kakashi. Go back to Konoha and tell them that the demon they despised for years has come back to this realm. Tell them I am back to keep my promise and there is not a soul in Konoha that can stand in my way, commanded Shao Kahn, as he picked Kakashi up, and threw him like a javelin high into the air until he landed on the main land where the bridge connected to wave country before bouncing hard multiple times from the impact. This is bad. The prophecy is coming true, thought Kakashi, as he found himself unable to stand much less walk due to the impact on the ground broke his other leg, and realized he had to crawl back to Konoha like a wounded dog. One thing Hataki. Tell them that this bridge is no longer the great Uchiha Sasuke bridge. It is the great Naruto bridge once more. Yelled Shao Kahn for all to hear in wave country before he leapt into the air and smashed one of the statues of Uchiha Sasuke with the wrath hammer on one side before doing it again on the other. When he was back on land again, within the borders of wave country, the people of the island nation gathered to cheer for him, calling Shao Kahn their hero once more. The former emperor of Outworld was a bit confused by this, as he had always ruled through fear, and intimidation by using his power to kill his enemies. And now here he was, being loved by the people around him, none of them being frightened by his appearance. They didn't care what he looked like or he was stained in the blood that came from the bodies of countless Konoha shinobi he had taken down to get to the castle. All they cared about regarding him was that he had returned to them. That he had returned and saved them all once more from enemy invaders. It was very strange to say the least. You seem surprised the people would embrace you after all this time Naruto-kun, said Tsunami after she and Inari approached him with the latter giving the giant man a hug. I'm not used to such praise. Contrary to what people here believe, I have been more of a villain than hero. If you had only seen what I had done since my escape from Konoha. If these people knew the truth behind how I am now, they would hate me, replied Shao Kahn as he wondered why such a feeling of being hated by the people here hurt him so much when it never bothered him before, and wondered if the elder gods were somehow responsible for messing with his heart before he left them. Or perhaps it was a part of him awakening. It doesn't matter to us because you will always be Naruto-kun in our eyes. Our hero who freed us from one tyrant and protected us from an army sent by another. Whether you are willing to accept it or not is up to you, declared Tsunami while trying to keep the blush that was forming on her face. You have to show me how you did all those cool things brother. Could you teach me? Questioned Inari while hoping he would since his fight with the shinobi, who entered his family's home to take them away had ended badly, and wanted to get stronger. My powers are. Unique Inari. I think you should focus your skills more in the ways of archery. I seem to recall you being an excellent shot with a crossbow. But, I think I can help teach you a bit about fighting should you fight someone using close range combat, replied Shao Kahn as he wasn't about to teach Inari such power, fearing it would corrupt him, or turn him into another Shang Tsung. One sorcerer like him was bad enough. Shao Kahn wasn't going to turn the boy into the man's replacement. Okay. I figured as much with the summoning of your weapon and moving so fast for a guy your size, said Inari while Shao Kahn nodded and noticed Tsunami was blushing now with lust in her eyes as she was admiring his body. And what a man he is. All that muscle and power. It makes a woman wonder just how much muscle he's really got under there. Thought Tsunami while shaking her head at the perverted things that came to mind. Just out of curiosity, how will your country be run? I was told your wave daimyo was killed some time ago, 
said Shao Kahn with the people looking saddened in hearing that. It's true I'm afraid. The wave daimyo wouldn't agree to the terms set by Konoha or the fire daimyo for that matter. They killed him when they invaded to make it so we needed a form of government set up under their control to keep us in line, replied Tsunami, as she saw Inari's face scrunch up in thought before they went wide at an idea. Wait. Big brother here can be the daimyo, declared Inari while Shao Kahn looked at him with a bit of surprise though not too much since he did consider the idea of taking the throne of only to be protected politically in certain areas one gets from such a station. That's a wonderful idea Inari exclaimed Tsunami, as the people around them were all in agreement, and were clearly supporting the idea with their voices calling out for Shao Kahn to lead them. Very well. I shall become the ruler of Wave Country. However, I must things clear to you right here, and now regarding my identity. At one point in my life, I was once called Uzumaki Naruto. Your hero. Your savior. But my time away, I have done things, horrible things to survive where I have been, and return to you like this as a result of it. One of the changes I had to make, was to forsake my old name, and was given a new one for the life I have lived before coming back to this realm. As such, from this day forward, I wish to be addressed not as Uzumaki Naruto, but as Shao Kahn. Explained Shao Kahn with the people being shocked by this, but they nodded in understanding, and didn't see a reason to question their new ruler. All hail Shao Kahn. Daimyo of Wave Country yelled Inari with the crowd soon cheering and chanting his name. As for Shao Kahn, he felt something change within him. Not so much as a change in how he felt towards his enemies, but rather what was felt toward the people he now ruled, and wished to protect them from harm. Rather than rule through oppression, as he had done for years after the fall of the Dragon King well over a millennia ago, the former emperor felt the need to rule these people fairly and make sure his new subjects were taken care of while at the same time keeping a firm hand to ensure they didn't get too carried away. Maybe Uzumaki Naruto was more alive than he gave himself credit. In any case, the giant of a man needed to assess the damage wave country had suffered while being occupied by Konoha Shinobi. Once he finished with that and repairing the damage done, he would seek out his old friends in high places throughout the elemental countries to gather allies in the war that was to come. If it hadn't already, to be continued. Remember to subscribe and like this video. See you in the next video.